All right, all right, all right. Recording. Blue Podcast 2, Daisy Dominguez. What's going on? How are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. It's Saturday. It's the weekend. It's my time off. Yes, ma'am. And it uh, might start rainstorming out there right now, but we are inside in uh, Blue Podcast headquarters about to record here, so we'll stay nice and dry. Yes. Yes, please. We should do like a little weather forecast for uh, for people. Like the sun went away. Looks like a lot of clouds and misery coming our way. You might want to steer clear. We can do our <laughs> make little... sure you have your umbrellas ready. Don't forget them. Yes. The, the, thank you for mentioning for everybody to be prepared. Um, yeah, we could do a little like weather person thing and do the broadcast for people. Be like, it's not good, but uh, everything's nice and smooth here at the Blue Podcast. Yes. Blue podcast. Um. So you just got back from Hawaii. I did. Not that long ago. Um, I went a couple of weeks ago. It was my first trip, you know, after COVID and everything. I got my vaccine in March and April. So as soon as I was vaccinated, I was ready to get on the plane. I love traveling. Like on, on a regular basis throughout the years, I at least take four to six trips a year. So I'm a huge fan of traveling, getting away and relaxing. So I was excited about Hawaii. It's my second time going already. So it was nice. It was great. The weather wasn't as, as good as the last time because it was raining a lot. So I did more hiking than being out at the beach. Hiking's good. I mean, you exercise a lot as it is, but then going on vacation to exercise a little bit more? Yeah, well, I was hiking a volcano, so it didn't really feel like it was exercising. Um, we actually did it for like almost half a day and I didn't even realize how many hours it had been, um, but it was beautiful. It was so crazy just going through the volcano. We felt like we had gone through different uh, seasons. It started off really hot and then it was like all this rain and then it was like dark and gloomy. Um, but it was awesome because different parts of the area that we were hiking, it was just a different temperature, different everything. Yeah. and. Uh... I don't know if the listeners can hear this in the background, but we did just hear some loud thunder and lightning. And uh, I don't know if that picks up on the microphones or not. We will see in the ultimate recording. But was it raining like that in Hawaii or no? Uh, no, not that bad. Uh, it was more like just drizzling here and there. It would it would scatter. It would be a little bit here, and then it would stop, and it would come back. So, no, it wasn't that bad. That's good because Hawaii, in my mind, equates to heaven on earth. Oh, it is. It is. Have you been? I have not been. Oh, my God. That has to be on your list. I've it been is. twice already. I went two years ago, so right before the 2019 in May, and then I went just now in May again. Yeah, I definitely want to get there, but it is a long trip, kind of. Like, if you travel a lot, probably like, well, a long trip is like China. Or yeah, like I was going to say, I was like, it doesn't seem that long for me. It's eight. I think it's about eight hours if you do direct. The yeah. first time I did was direct. But this second time, I'm not going to lie, it was terrible. And it, this was actually the shortest one available. But I also got it, like, super last minute. I, I literally booked the trip two, three days before I left. So I didn't have a lot of options. Um, had I maybe booked in advance, I probably would have found a better flight. But this one was, like, 11 hours. And I had to get on three planes. I went from Chicago to Denver, then from Denver to L.A., and then from L.A. to Hawaii. So that wasn't fun trying to get on three different flights, um, but it was worth it. So you said the first time you did it direct from Chicago to yeah. Hawaii? Mm-hmm. And that was eight hours when you did yeah, it? Yeah, I think it was eight hours. Yeah. yeah. And then three flights is a lot. Yeah, it was. But the good thing was that um, the layovers weren't long. So the layover literally was like 30 an hour. You weren't waiting too long, and then you got on the next one. So eight direct it was about 11 hours so it's like an additional it was just an additional two hours just because of adding the layover and moving yeah mm-hmm. layovers are a pain in the butt but that is a long time to be on a flight like you know we're we're attorneys we're busy like people want to talk to you it's like that's a long chunk out of your day yeah that's like a whole d- i i literally um when i was seeing how many days i would be in hawaii i had to reduce two because the flight back and then the flight there yeah, you missed those two days here or on vacation. And how long were you there for? Uh, not that long. I only went for about a week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, there's studies that they say they've done on people who go on vacation. They say it takes like three or four days before you get adjusted to the environment mm. that you're in. 
to where you like really feel unwinded, like you're now on vacation? You know, the first couple of hours, no, because usually when I travel, I have so much to do beforehand, right? I have to take care of all my clients, get a lot of things done, so I'm not, uh, I don't have anything urgent to do or take care of while I'm on vacation. And then I have to clean, get everything set up, pack, get ready. So usually the day or two before I'm traveling, I am super stressed, just, just doing stuff back to back to back. So then when I was at the, at the plane, I'm like, so stressed. I still feel the stress on my shoulders. Like, I can't relax, you know? But then after, once I landed in Hawaii, oh, I was like, oof, I'm relaxed, I'm here, and I'm feeling good. So I didn't feel like it took me two, three days to, like, adjust to being on vacation. But definitely the first couple of hours just doing the flight, I was still feeling the stress, trying to force myself to, like, relax. You're on vacation already. But once I landed, I was already on vacation mode. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, because... I always try to pack in advance of leaving for trips, but it doesn't always work out that way. But this last time I went out of town for Memorial Day mm-hmm. and uh, I did pretty much pack on the weekend right before we were leaving. So mm-hmm. I was pretty much good to go and we left at a reasonable hour. We got to our destination at a reasonable time, you know, we're road tripping okay. for us. It's like a six and a half hour drive where we go. So, but it's well worth it, um, especially because you know when you get back here you probably realize how much you miss being gone a little bit you're like oh my uh-huh. god this this steady what my dad would call rat race that we live in yeah sensory overload all the time like you go here you can barely turn right because somebody's walking out and then there's like you know cars coming you have to like watch where you're like turning and there's like planes going by yeah. planes trains automobiles yeah um, but I am also, like, uh, a busy city person that I sometimes I even enjoy that. Like, sometimes people who don't like that kind of lifestyle hate New York, right? I love New York. I'm like, oh, my God, there's so much to do. There's, like, people everywhere. There's just, like, busy lifestyle. Um, but I do need to give myself. That's why I take my vacation. I need to give myself the time to just unwind and just not think about work and just do fun stuff and you know zone out um and my trips vary like i'll do four to six but they're not every every trip is not a week you know some of those will be just a quick weekend thursday to sunday or friday to monday um two three days and then coming back but just the fact of leaving getting on that plane and being somewhere different even if it's just a weekend it's it's a good relaxing yeah my friend told me, like, in, in the industry, like, I'm, I practice real estate law, but I'm in the real estate industry. And he says you have to take short, frequent vacations so that you avoid burnout. Yeah, burnout is a real thing. He I... said the same thing. That's what he says, <laughs> burnout's a real thing. Uh, literally the same word. The exact same word. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I learned that the hard way early on uh, when I started my practice. And after that, I was like, you know what? Nope. I gotta, I need to have a good life work balance. And then from that point on, I really made it a point to set boundaries, to give myself time to relax, to make time for my trips, to, you know, do the things that I do for me. Um, Because otherwise it's just like, you can't do everything and your body will shut down on you, you know? So I, I learned that the hard way. And from there, I turn things around and now I'm even happier. I mean, I'm still just as busy, if anything, more work, but now I just balance things better. Yeah, it's good to get to the point, and you really have to work at it because, you know, it, what year did you graduate from law school? 2013. 2013. Okay, I was 2014, so you graduated your I was right going to say, I was like, you were either same year or year after or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like I remember seeing you at, like, the Concord Music Hall or someplace, and we were all hanging <laughs> out dancing after, like, uh, what was the... Like South American slash Mexican festival oh, they have with John Marshall. The um the Lasa Fiesta Fiesta. Fiesta. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was for the Latin American Student Association Lasa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was one I think we that, all went over there one night, and I remember you since that day. I was like, oh, she's really cool. You know? Yeah, I everybody loves Fiesta. I feel like that was a huge event that everybody from wherever you come from was looking forward to it. Fiesta was yeah. huge and fun. <laughs> I mean, it was the most fun student event they did. Like. All the other student organizations, Middle Eastern students, the Greek students, Irish, like whoever, we were all going to that party. That <laughs> I was know. The best one. We, were we right planned there the for that. We planned in advance a whole semester around Fiesta. Like, what's our theme? What are we going to do? You know, get our budget. Like, that is our biggest event. And we want to, you know, go all out and make sure everyone's having a good time. End of the year, let's have a party. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think I'm going to try to make it 
uh, habit to crash the <laughs> Fiesta every year. I've gone twice as an alum, um, and it's still just as great. So we'll go together. Let me know. We'll see if they – well, they probably won't – no, it already passed. And I'm sure they probably didn't do it this year. But next year, once things go back to normal, yes. Sounds good Buy to me. Buy our tickets. Yes, I, <laughs> it, that'll be our like my – reason to get back to john marshall because i haven't been there in a little while so if i could go there once a year and it was for fiesta that'd be really cool yeah because those were some of the most fun memories i had at john marshall i think and um i've gone well i i'm teaching there too so i feel like i never disconnected myself from john marshall but i love it i'm the kind of alum that still stays connected to whatever school i go to even my high school and my college so i love my teachers i love my experience so i stay connected Oh my god, another loud I know. Thunder. Though the funny thing is, there's a window behind you so I can actually see it. I feel know? like it's also like a meditation sound behind, kind you of. know? Like when you're in the spa and you have the ocean or the rain playing in the background for you to relax. Riders on the storm. <laughs> Into this world you're born. Riders uh. on the storm, something, something, I don't know, riders on the storm. Yeah, it's, it's totally, yeah, it sounds like that like little meditation thing in the back, yeah. which is totally cool. I. I feel like I need to listen to those CDs more often before I go to bed or listen you to have my mind. I don't have them, but I mean, oh. we could probably get to them. <laughs> but uh, I, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I, I, it would be cool to have them because I sleep so well when it rains out. Like, oh, really? Okay. Well, it could be a bad storm or even just a nice shower. You just hear that. It like drowns out everything else. And all I hear, do like you know? hearing the rain outside my window. When the windows open and you hear the rain, I do like that. Yes, ma'am. But I feel like this little storm is cutting our day down early. I don't mind if the rain comes when I'm going to sleep. Like, mm -hmm. oh, if you want to start your shift when I go to bed, we're all be good. Great. That'll be great. <laughs> You're but like, right don't now be your shift my is Saturday ruining my day. Afternoon. Yes. Yeah, or, my, no. or my Hawaii time. Right? Hawaii it did. Time. It did. I literally, like, half of my luggage was all nothing but swimsuits. And I used one. I was so sad. I was like, I expected more sun and beach. And I didn't get to wear half of my luggage because. Just couldn't. But I did do uh, snort, no, not snorkeling, scuba diving on the one or two days that I was able to get out to the ocean. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, it's a shame because you're probably all like, here, you're like in a hotel room, got your camera, like, here's another one I didn't get to wear. Here's another one I didn't get to <laughs> right? wear. Right, <laughs> all the ones. Let me show you all the ones I didn't get to wear. I know I've been working so hard during the winter time for summer body, and dang, I didn't even get to wear it. Well, the summer is young. I know. Yeah, just starting. It, it is just starting. It was, um, it seems like everything was delayed by like a month or two this year. Like, it stayed cold for a long time, and it didn't, uh, didn't finally get hot till like right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like there wasn't a lot of spring, you know? Because it just felt no. like it went from cold to then straight to summer. Yeah, I didn't feel a whole lot of spring. No, I mean, it's raining right now. We're getting, we're getting spring weather. It was like this thing where it's like, oh, it's been a cold year with COVID-19, and now it's just roaring 20s, everybody. <laughs> Let's do this. Like, the summer, take off your mask. Everybody's vaccinated. CDC says you can do whatever the hell you want. And, or if you lived in Florida or Texas, you've been doing whatever the hell you want. Yeah, Life is good. Right? <laughs> Life is good. I, um... I was just thinking too, I was like, man, it's been a rough year because I, you've just been cooped up. Like you didn't even have the summer to get to go out to get away because it was uh, COVID and then you have winter, so you're stuck at home. And I'm like, man, how was I gonna survive this winter? But it wasn't bad. I mean, I stayed occupied doing projects. I have my puppy, so he kept me occupied. So the time went by, I was like, oh, I'm ready for, I'm ready for my social life back. So I'm excited for a hot girl summer this year. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Said like a champion. You know what I mean? Um, that winter kept us locked inside and, um, you know, I don't know, you do your indoor activities, I guess, and just wait for, you know, the good times. Yes, yes, I did. I took advantage of uh, the, all the pandemic time. I try to, you know, turn it around a lot. Of, in the beginning, it was hard, right? Because nobody's happy about the situation, but it is what it is. So I just try to put a, a positive spin to it to see how I can make the the most use of my time during this pandemic, what to adjust, focus on me. If I'm not out socializing and, you know, spending my weekends just hanging out with friends and I'm home, then let's work on home projects. Let me work on taking care of me. So I just try to focus on things that I couldn't normally do 
during regular times that now I have time for to do throughout a whole year. So I actually, and after, after adjusting a little bit in the beginning, I started to enjoy it. I was like, all right, great. I have a long time to be able to do this, this, and that and get all these things done. And then when, you know, life comes back, then I can go back to my social life and I've already taken care of all these bunch of things. So, so you had everything kind of like use that as just preparation time. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to, but it didn't quite work out that way for me. I feel like I put a lot of plans in place, you know, and now I have the podcast going, which is good because I have all this technical equipment set up properly and I can film this thing and record it and put it out there. And then getting it set up to put it out online is a whole thing in and of itself, too. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was kind of in the planning stage throughout COVID. What would kind of ruin that? And the thing, the funny thing is, I wish I was ready to go with the podcast as soon as COVID started. Because uh -huh. there were so many people who had so much time, but everybody's afraid of each other. They're yeah. like, hey, man, like, we'll probably be all right, but I don't want to get the COVID right, from you and stuff like that. Right. Just breathing at each other. Exactly. You know what I mean, I mean we're a decent enough amount of distance, distance apart that we right. might be all right, or we could have done it with masks on. But I feel like... When I was listening to podcasts during the pandemic, it helped to get me through it a bit because mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, there's still stuff going on out there. People are still talking, having conversations, and, uh, you know, life is still going on. It kind of kept me company because, you know, if you're, you're inside, you're exercising or you're cleaning the house, you got, mm -hmm. like, something going on, you know. So I, I kind of wish I was able to do it back then, but I'm glad it everything seems to work out at the right time yeah yeah exactly well i focused on things that i i could just do myself you know i ended up getting a, a dog which i've wanted a dog for a long time but my busy schedule i never had the time to get a puppy and i thought if i'm gonna get a puppy i need to make sure i have time for in the beginning to train it and make sure he's adjusted otherwise i'm gonna have a bad dog for like a while and trying to train an older dog is gonna just be more challenging so when everything started with the pandemic, I was like, this is the time. Because at first I thought it'd be, you know, a short amount of time. I didn't expect it to be a whole year. But I figured it'd be long enough for me to train a puppy. And uh, I was like, if it doesn't happen now, I'm never getting a dog. So I, uh, I got my puppy and he was great. It also helped me because I live by myself. So I was like, who am I going to talk to? I can't be uh, just talking to people on the phone or on Zoom. You know, it gets exhausting after a while. So I was like... I need company so I'm not sounding like a crazy person just talking to myself and so he was great he was literally a lifesaver for me and now I love him I was like thank god you came into my life in a perfect time what kind of dog do you have he's a mixed Pomeranian poodle Pomeranian poodle I've seen him on Facebook yeah oh Cute I post all about he's got his Instagram page too <laughs> he has an Instagram page he did I mean I'm not as active as I was when he was little because it's hard to manage multiple Instagram pages so I was like oh his is the last one I even look at I haven't even looked at it in a while I haven't posted I post more about him in my personal uh social media pages and then I forget to post it onto his too well I feel like the youth is probably managing like multiple you know instagram or whatever pages that's a lot on there like easily though like for yeah. me I'm, like, I'm not even on instagram i'm like on facebook and that's the only thing like i Got don't want to like invest my time in like learning something else or then like with instagram you constantly have to be posting like something new right kind of like oh look at what i eat you know? well you don't have to some people like literally won't post anything but they just watch other people to see what they're doing with life you know um i like both i feel like but i feel like i'm more active on instagram than on facebook but that's where I draw the line. It's like just Instagram and Facebook. I don't have whatever, Snapchat or TikTok or all the other ones. Because now I feel like it's too much. I'm yeah. good with just Instagram and Facebook. And they're all kind of variations on the same thing. Like, yeah, right. Like one is like this minus this or this plus that. Like yeah. really, like we got to do this many different ones, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder, like, how popular is your dog on Instagram? Um, he's got some followers. Not as many as I was thinking he'd have, but I think if I was more active on it, he'd probably have more followers. I think he has, like, under 100. Not a lot. I mean, that's still pretty good. Mm-hmm. Because, like, I thought you were going to be like, oh, my God, you know, my dog has, like, couple thousand followers no. like man i'm jealous of your I dog I wish, wish. I wish i had that many i wish no we were actually at a doggy birthday and one of the other dogs he does he's popular on instagram i was like <laughs> wow that's great he's famous on instagram and i was like well i just got it because i was like he has to have his own page i was excited about having a dog and you want to do everything i got him clothes i got him a bunch of things i spoil him 
I was like, he's like my child. I don't have kids, so he is my child. So. Well, wouldn't it be crazy if your dog became like this huge Instagram celebrity or social media celebrity right? where like your dog ends up like sitting poolside on a cabana with their glasses on. <laughs> they have like a sandwich and like a drink and everything. Yeah. And they're, like, they're just like rubbing his little back and head <laughs> yes all the help they could need people coming over bring everything making you rich and um like you know what i mean like you're just like it's having like a child celebrity like uh -huh. your dog is like justin bieber or something right? just that's like it child i'm gonna get back star. on instagram and i'm gonna start working it up a little bit more yeah maybe get some ad revenue off right? your dog or something it's like, hey man, all the things I do for you, you need to start, you need to start, you know, bringing in some money here too. <laughs> <laughs> I got him a little backpack whenever we go places, and it's got his little treats in them. And then I put his little backpack on it, and I tell everyone, I was like, I'm not carrying his stuff. I have my bag. He has his bag. He has to carry his own stuff. Well, and, what doesn't kill him will only make right? him stronger. Right? I was like, here, it's not, it's not that heavy. You can handle it. And he looks super cute with his little backpack. He's doing little weighted hikes with you and stuff like that now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I was like, he would have enjoyed Hawaii on that long hike. No, he probably would have lasted like a mile and then he would have been like, carry me. So uh, this time you said you did more hiking. Mm -hmm. there? So I did. Well, we hiked in like different places. It's hard to remember because my friends were the ones planning where and the location and I was just following. I know we went to the big island and we hiked one of the volcanoes there. Yeah. And then there was, uh, then we went back to Honolulu, and then there, there was some other, like, hiking places to go to. So you started before, wait, before you got to Honolulu, or? So I start, I landed at the Big Island. Yeah. So my friends, uh, they got there a couple of days beforehand, so they um, got to Honolulu first. They were there for a couple of days, and then I met them up in um, the Big Island, because they wanted to just go to the Big Island for a couple of days, check out the volcano, and then come back. So I just met them at the Big Island, and then from there we went back together to Honolulu. How many islands are there in Hawaii, do you know? Oh, I don't know. I've only been to Honolulu, and now the Big Island. Yeah. I think there's Maui, but I haven't been there. I feel, I don't know. See, talking on these podcasts exposes how, how the knowledge that I lack. Not that everybody knows. I bet you could ask like 100 Americans walking down the street how many islands there are in Hawaii. Like, you know what I mean? They wouldn't know. But I don't know. I think, it's, I think it's like five. I'm bad four with. Four or five of the, mm -hmm. the main ones. Maybe there's a little smaller ones on around it, too, or something. Got it. Yeah, no, I've only been to Honolulu and the Big Island. And the Big Island was new now because uh, my friend's friend who, it was more of his trip, he wanted to go and check out the volcano. I was like, well, that's great because then I get to explore another area. This is not my second trip, so I'm down to see something new. And it was worth it. It was nice. The volcano was awesome. I think I saw you walking on some like dried yeah, up lava. Yeah, it something. was like yes, it was. It was crazy. I didn't think that we were we would actually be allowed to walk on that. And then as we were hiking up, I could see like little tiny people, and I'm like, is that people? Are they down there? Are we even allowed down there? And then as we kept hiking the trail, yeah, it led us to there. And then you would literally hike all the way through it. It felt like I was in the Lion King movie. You know in the Lion King where he's like, the dark area is like, Simba, don't go there. And then it's like all of the bones and he goes there. That's what it literally felt like, but in real life. I was like, I'm in the Lion King movie. This thing looks surreal. It was awesome. That's crazy. And I mean, when you're walking on that stuff, it's, it's hard as rock. Yeah. Like it just, all it is is just dried up like iron yeah. and rock and like whatever. And then we were the like, are we even going the right way? What if we get lost? And once you commit to crossing, you know, you have to keep on going or, or turn back around if you're closed. Because otherwise, like, where, where do you go? You got to get back. You got to stay on the trail. Yeah. You didn't have a guide. You just go. Like, no, we went by ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So there would be these little like um, piles of rocks. And that was guiding you that that's the trail to stay within those areas where the piles of rocks are placed. That sounds like a tough way to mark a trail. Yeah, you know, I don't know thing. who did that, but yeah, it was. We did the whole thing. It was great. So, so this, so the Big Island is where you have a volcano. Mm -hmm. It's not active, mm -mm. right? Or at least not now. You don't right. have to worry about it now. How long does it take to do that hike? It took us, I want to say, like, like six hours. We were there for about six hours, maybe, or less, because we got there maybe around 10 o'clock, and we left around, like, 5, 5-ish. Five but we also took, like, a lunch break 
and then where there was a little store, we went there. So um, yeah. on the trail, like on the... no, no, not on the trail. So it was the visitor center. So as soon as we came in, yeah, we um, went to the store, checked out the little visitor center, and then as we were checking out different places, because you can drive to different areas of the of the park, and um, we then went from one side to the other side. And before we started hiking the volcano, we decided to have some lunch. So we had already brought our lunch. And we just sat, ate, and then started hiking. Yeah, it sounds like a good way to do it. Mm-hmm. Get a little, you know, food in your system. Otherwise, yeah. you, I don't have like, dude, I, I'm feeling kind of weak, man. I think my blood sugar's off yeah, or something like that. Yeah. I'm exhausted, dude. So we were ready and planned. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to have like a bunch of snacks with you or something if you weren't gonna eat beforehand. And the the sad part is, I would be the person to bring like a whole bunch of like trail mix or maybe some beef jerky or something, <laughs> and I'd have it all ate in the first like little part of the, the the hike, and then I'd be so hungry later. Oh my god, no! I'd be like Brian, stop, taste yourself, leave some for later. I'll try to, but I need that burst of energy. I don't mm. feel good unless it, like some people just sit there and kind of like. Take a little, you know, they're eating some like, you know, snacks or whatever, just a little bit at a time. Yeah, I need to, I need to feel almost full to feel all right. But then, really, I feel yeah. like if I'm too full, I don't have enough. Like I'm just tired, and I'm just stuffed. Um, that I actually didn't have a big lunch. I had a, I had an okay lunch. I think I had like this uh, pasta salad and some fruit. But then I'm also concerned, like, I don't know, is what I eat, is that going to make my stomach sick? What if I'm hiking and where am I going to go? I, no, 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 I'd rather be hungry and be okay and make it through and I'll eat when I get back. Eventually, no matter what, your body has to keep moving. You have to keep moving. So one way or another, you're going to get through that trail. That's true. That's true. And to your point, yes, I mean, it's like a double-edged sword, like, I have a, like, when I'm eating, I feel like, oh, my God, that tastes good. I, I don't feel too full. I could probably eat more. And then by the time I realize I'm full, it's too late. And <laughs> then I'm tired and stuff like that. Like, I always have to watch what I eat lately because, first of all, I'd like to eat better than I have been in the past couple of weeks. Because I'm eating a lot of, like, sandwiches and tacos, whatever. I mean. Uh, the tacos are so good. That's true. And they're, they're, like, the perfect mix of carbs and protein mm-hmm. and vegetables and stuff like that. So it's they're not terrible, but like I always have to like watch what I order because if I'm working and I have like a, cl- a real estate closing to do or something, if I eat and then I have to go there. I'm just like dragging, like I have that crash right before yeah. I go. I'm like, food is supposed to energize you, not like make you fall asleep. And, yeah, but it does. well, I think it will depend on what you're eating. You know, well, it's um, always sandwiches. if you eat, <laughs> yeah, if you eat something heavy, I feel like you'll get more tired. I mean, I'm not an expert or nutritionist, but I just feel like, um, but for me, when I'm working, I, I forget I'm hungry. Like, I'm just on the go. I don't I don't really take, like, lunch breaks. I'll do snacks in between, or I'll have my shakes. I'll make my shake, and then that gets me through, and I don't really have my big meal until after work when I'm done with everything. I cook, and then I, I eat. I'm trying to get better about not eating so late. But the problem is that I'll finish work, what, five, six, then I work out, and then after that I'm cooking. So by the time I finish, it's like seven, eight o'clock, but I'm trying to get better about at least eating before, having dinner before seven o'clock, um, no later than eight. Um, so then I'll either try to prep stuff ahead of time. Like on Monday, I'll make a bigger size meal, so then I'll have it for Wednesday and Thursday, and then the, at least those days I can eat at a earlier time. Yeah, I've tried so many things, um, prepping for like almost the whole week in advance, and then I find I think that's too much. It's too much. It is too much. Yeah, and sometimes the food won't be as good by the end of the week. Yeah, I think a mid like prepping um, either Sunday or Monday, and then on a Wednesday. That's what they say to do is like Mm -hmm. every three days, right? Because I've tried the whole week, and then by the time I get to, you know, Thursday or Friday, you get into the food that you made, and you're like. It doesn't have that same zest, you know. Yeah. I mean? It's like a little, it's bland, like it's mm-hmm. like not as high speed. The brakes are being pumped. It's not as good. Probably shouldn't be eating that. Yeah, I mean, you could, but it's not going to give you the same, you know, nutri- right. nutritional value feeling that you would have gotten, I guess. When you, yeah, if you would ate it when it was fresh. No, I agree. That's why I I I had done like maybe some time ago, way back the week, and it was just like no, it was. I saw that that just wasn't working, so I did in between. I'll do it in between, or when I can, I'll do every day. Um, if I can cook every day, it just depends on my schedule. Yeah, it's tough to cook every day. It really is, because I would like to. Although, like, stop at five, or maybe go grab some fresh fruit, and then just just 
brill or whatever. Mm -hmm. Definitely very hard to do that. I'll try to balance it. Like if I cook every day, I'll try to balance between like things that take a little longer to cook and then like quick like things like a soup. Some days I'll just be making like a big soup and those are super quick and easy to do. So it won't be as long. It's not like I'm cooking, you know, a long time every day. So I'll do a balance of those things. And I think that works out. So we'll see. Well, if it's quick and easy for you to do soup, you probably know how to do it pretty well. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I'm not. The, I'm actually not a, gr a great cook. I'm working on my cooking skills. I've been working on my cooking skills. I feel like I've gotten better from when I started because when I started, I could literally burn down a kitchen. Like everybody was like, don't let Daisy into the kitchen. That's how bad of a cook I was. <laughs> And then I was like, I have to start learning. I mean, if I want to have a healthy lifestyle, I need to be cooking. And so I started slowly learning. I still sometimes will forget, oh, my God, I left the, I left the oven on, you know. Or um, I'll accidentally uh, put the flame and I think it's off, but it's actually so low. I turned it to just really low, but not completely off. I'm like, oh, my God, one of these days I'm going to burn my kitchen down. But I'm, I've gotten better. I've gotten better. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Not not a complete expert. Not that I wouldn't invite all my friends and family for me to cook them a dinner yet, but I would invite one person. At least it won't be that bad. So your science experiment person who comes by to try the one meal. Yes, yes, I've done it for a couple of friends. Or sometimes I'll have my friends that are good cooks. I'll be like, come over, you know, let's have a cooking date so that they can teach me. The hard part is when I'm trying to learn something new and difficult, I need the first time around. It sucks unless someone's doing it with me. And like then if they do it with me and they show me, then I'm good. But if I try doing it myself, it's definitely a struggle that first time. But then after that, I I figured out my mistakes. Well, that's good. It is a learning process like most things in life. Mm hmm. Practice but makes perfect. You have to keep practicing. You really do. You really do. It's got to be like a daily thing. Like, be comfortable with what is uncomfortable and just do it and get yeah. through it. Yeah. But to be able to quick or quickly cook a soup, you know, like I see people show stuff on their Facebook or whatever, and it's like it looks really delicious. And like, oh yeah, homemade. Like, if it. If it, if it doesn't take you that long, like, what do you what do you do to make the broth? Like, how do you get it done real quick? Like, what do you add in to make it like that finished product so quick and then just stir it around? Uh huh. Like, I, I watch a lot, lot of, of um. You know, I feel like I'm a very basic cook. Uh, I don't really do like Latino dishes because I feel like those are just complicated. Um. So I'll do like, let's see, my soups. I'll do super Toscana. That's actually I thought that that was gonna be hard, but it's actually not. It's very Simple and easy, and I feel like I like my Super Toscana better than the Olive Garden one. I'll do um, like this squash creamy soup. I forget what that's called. That one's really good. I'll cook a lot of chicken and ground beef, so I'll mix that up into different things. Whatever I can put in the in the oven, I love because then that's super easy. Sometimes I can be doing other things or cleaning up or whatever, and I just stuff everything in the oven. It's cooking itself, so I use the oven a lot. <laughs> All this talking about cooking is making me. <laughs> Sorry. Did you have any breakfast? No, I didn't. Oh no. No, I didn't. Yeah, you're gonna be hungry now. I did. I did eat some snacks. Yeah, I was planning on going, but it got away from me. There's a restaurant right down the street. Shout out to Sammy's Kitchen. To everybody listening, 55th and Central. <laughs> nice. They take care of you. They hook you up. Uh, I was gonna go over there for a breakfast sandwich. I just needed like some fats and protein, so I was gonna get like a little like sausage, egg and cheese, or whatever, oh, just nice. something to get some yes. fats and proteins in me, whatever. But I didn't do it. But uh, as far as what's for dinner, I don't know. Um, I was going to grill, and I think the chaos is now over with the storm. I don't know. Hopefully. Maybe it just passed, but I was gonna grill in the little extra lot out here, and uh, there's UFC fights on tonight. Oh so yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna watch those. Yeah. That'll be good. I well, I have a couple parties, so whatever they're cooking, I'm looking forward to that. I'm so excited. Um, speaking of a grill, I need to buy a grill because now that I got my house, I'm like getting everything in my yard set up. I got my furniture coming in, and I'm like, I need a grill. I was like, I can't have people over and do barbecues without a grill. Um, but I was going to get one of those little fire pits, and one of my yeah. friends was actually saying, well, you can grill on there too. You don't need a, a bigger grill. I don't know yet, so because I thought I would get a a bigger grill, like an actual yeah. grill. We'll see. Slowly getting a couple things. 
Yeah, it depends on what you like or how much you need. Like, honestly, mm. you can cook for a pretty big crowd even with a small grill. Mm. So, you know, traditionalists, like traditional barbecue people, like probably charcoal or wood. Mm. But that takes a while. You got to, like, that takes a lot of more learning. Whereas with, oh. you just get yourself a nice propane one, it's hot and ready to go, like, very quickly. Got it. And it doesn't take much. You don't have to, like... Are those, you know, wood chips ready yet so we can smoke the hell out of this meat or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, are they the right temperature or did we put enough to keep to cook all the stuff that we have that we need to cook? Where is it appropriate? Just turn it on, whatever, you know? Yeah, well, I, mean, I just learned something now, too. So I feel like I'm learning little things with regards to my house on things that I hadn't thought about. Because before I had a condo, we actually didn't have a backyard. Yeah. I didn't realize when I got my condo after I moved in until the summertime came that... I didn't even pay attention whether there was a yard or no yard. Um, and I was like, well, I'm not doing, I'm not hosting any barbecues here. So I never really even thought about it. And now that i am got my house, I'm like working on learning different things of maintaining the house, getting things for the house. And since it's just me, it's like I can't ask anyone who lives with me, hey, do you want to take care of the grill or do all those things? I'm kind of figuring it out myself. But it's fun. It's exciting, you know? It is. You see the fruits of your labor the rewards yes. of your work yes i bought a lawnmower and i was like all right let's see i'm posting on facebook recommendation guys what's a good lawnmower <laughs> everybody gave me recommendations i ended up buying one it was great actually the one i bought super like easy to use and uh lawn like mowing the lawn doesn't feel like hard work but taking care of all the weeds oh my god that's where all the hard work is i was like man i'm breaking my back over here well, yeah, because weeds are the details. Uh. Like the lawn itself is the bigger picture. But when you got to get down to the weeds, you're like, ooh, that doesn't look good there. Yeah. You know, kill I've that been, weed or whatever. I've been trying to, like, fix up the the lawn right now. And apparently the previous owners, the my neighbor said that they, that they liked the weeds. And I'm like, what? So I have a lot of mess to be dealing with right now that I'm trying to get rid of to, like, clean out and stuff. And it hasn't, that hasn't been fun. But mowing it. I'm like in and out, it's great. I don't mind it, but I'm like, it's a workout. I feel like being out in the yard, it's another workout for me. So I'm enjoying the process. It's still my house and I'm happy there. So anything I do for it, I'm like excited doing. Well, it sounds like uh, you got everything kind of pretty well rounded now. Your dog has a nice yard. I know, he's super you excited. Have a nice yard, mm -hmm. you know, and you do you have a gas mower or an electric no mower? it's an electric. electric yeah is it cordless or do you have to have a no it's it has a cord yeah well those you kind of gotta like do your little you know ballerina routine yeah like, you know, right switch it over right. and do all this place it, i place it over my shoulder and move it around yeah yeah well it's all good um they do the job and they're efficient or whatever right, i mean right there's 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 not many bad mowers out there and there's not even a lot of like variety either mm -hmm. you have like briggs and strat and then you have a honda and then you have electric like black and decker or whatever mm -hmm. and um you know so but they all go get the job done i guess yeah this one gets the job done and it's not that difficult to to work you know i just wanted something simple something not so heavy something that i can that it can be good for me to just manage and it was great and then it was cheap it was like 100 bucks i was like yes Please, thank you. Yeah, so where'd you get it? <laughs> I got it at Home Depot. Okay. And it was like selling out. They were like, there's one left. I was like, I'm taking it. I mean, hundred bucks sounds pretty affordable. <laughs> yeah, it was super affordable. It was great. And I was like, and if it breaks next year, it's okay. It was a hundred bucks. Then I'll just, you know, get another one. Okay. Or some people are like, hire a company. And I'm like, but I want to do this. Like, it's not about having somebody. I want to start taking care of my house. I want to I learn some of these things, you know? And so I was like, and it's fine. Like, it's not that I have the time for it and it's a workout for me so i'm okay we'll see how how i am about that as it gets hotter so i'm like oh i don't know if i'm gonna want to be out there in 90 degree weather but um the last two times i actually did it later in the evening i'm like my neighbors are probably gonna think i'm crazy like yeah. what is this girl doing later in the evening mowing her lawn i was like but the sun's not out and it's still light enough that i could do it why do i need to be out in the sun in the middle of the day mowing my lawn who says that's the rule yeah, there there is no rule like that, and a lot of people don't have the time to do it during the day, so they will do it when they get home in the evening. Um, it is cooler then. Um, but yeah, no. Now that you have your house, like 
you could pay somebody else to do it, but it all adds up after a while. That's true, yeah. I mean, it's not that expensive, but you're right. It does add up. And at least for me, I like to be, I like to, um, I'm, I love handling money and my finances. And if I can save and have money and, you know, balance that out and have for other things, I would rather do that than be wasting my money on these services that I could very well do myself, you know? You end up getting a two unit? Um, no, so it's a it's a full house. It's three floors, so so a three unit. Three unit. Mm hmm. Okay. So I've got basement first first level and then the the top. It's great. It's huge for me, but I'm thinking long term. Right now, I kind of wanted to take advantage of the market and how interest rates were so low. I was like, right now is the perfect time to buy like my long term home and get a good deal on it. And I closed in February, so I was looking right before things got like. Crazy, because I feel like things are crazier right now. I don't know. This is, you know, your area that last February or the one that just this passed? this one that just passed. The, the one that just passed. It. And so I was able to like negotiate it down, get a good deal, and um, for like the size that it was, I was really excited. So I was like, this is the house I'm staying at for the next 10, 15 years, where I'm having my family. And um, so right now it's big for me, but I was thinking like for family when I do end up having a family i want to already have this space set up and i want to have a, a good loan with a good interest rate yeah i mean you probably have those things now because if you got your loan in february that was probably about the best time to get yeah. your, your loan it was rate. it was a really good interest rate and then shortly after that um because my lender she's a friend of mine family friend she was like yeah it's gone up i talked to her a couple months later she's like oh yeah it's those those rates aren't there anymore. I'm like, oh, thank God. You were at the about, about the perfect time. Yeah, and I was almost gonna just kick the the this deal to the curb because I was getting really frustrated with the with the seller. But then I kept going to the house to visit it, and I was like, no, I do. I gotta. I'm gonna stick through this. Let's just keep negotiating, and then finally we just close. But I was several times ready to just be like, I'm I'm done. There'll be more houses. Maybe in the spring it'll be better. But after I see everything that's happened now, I'm like, oh, thank God. I. I did stay with this house and I found it during the fall because I found it maybe in like December and then we closed in like February. So, so yeah, two months. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's about standard. Yeah. But it's a good thing you stuck it out because what I see in my practice is a lot of people backing out over like personal feelings. It's how it's mm -hmm. like, you want the house. Like, what do you care if this person is an asshole or, you know, whatever? Like, if your ultimate goal is that, it's like, yeah, they're a little annoying to deal with, but like, you can put up with them so that you get this thing that if it goes away like a house mm -hmm. because it goes to another buyer you're never going to get that back right mm -hmm. or you you likely not what are you going to sit there wait to buy a house until 20 years down the line 30 years down the line when they finally sell again a whole generation has gone by yeah. once you lose that you lose it so like exactly I'm, i would be willing to tolerate a lot of things to get what i want right right you know but that's easier said than done when you're on the, when you're being the buyer and you you do have all these emotions like I really had to keep talking to myself like, hey, think about it, you know, put your emotions aside. And my realtor was actually great. He was really good with managing me too. So he was like, let's let's like put our emotions aside. Let's think about this. So we would keep going back to the house. Well, I'm glad you had somebody telling house. you to do yeah. that. But I thought you would already be like naturally good at it. Isn't that what I they would. taught us in law school? Is like I would. Objective decision making, putting your emotions to the side. Right. And just looking at the objective and all this, right. whatever objective really means or whatever. But I'm telling you that you just, this seller was just unbelievable that he was he was testing testing me a lot and I was like god damn it but it's it's okay we you know I kept after after releasing all my emotions I kept thinking back again okay let's think putting our emotions aside think clearly then I had my realtor helping me out and so we all came together and now I got my house I'm happy there it was a great decision it was a lot of hard work and and back and forth but it was worth it and now I just get to relax, enjoy it, and keep doing house projects and building a life there. Good on you, sister, <laughs> for all that. And you know what? I feel like we could like toast our little um, cheers, our cuffs, because I took advantage of low interest rates too. Mm -hmm. So when I bought this building, I took out extra money for repairs. And when you do that, they charge you a higher interest rate. Oh. So my interest rate was higher than it should have been. I went from 5.1% down to 2.75. Nice. So usually the bank, the man's coming out on top, but I feel like it's victory for Team yes. Tierney on this one. It's 1-0 one because nice. I went from 5.1, put some extra cheese on top of the building to fix it up, and uh, now I'm down to 2.75, and here's what happened to me. 
they sent me the letter and they said, we can refinance you for 2.75% interest with the same bank that I was already working with. Uh -huh. And I said, okay, that sounds good to me. I hadn't seen any rates lower than that. I accepted the 2.75 and one week later, they sent me a letter that said 3.1 interest if I wanted to refinance again. And I said, one week later, if I had waited, it would have been 3.1, but oh I got it in God, at 2.75. Oh my God, that is great. That's awesome. Cheers again. Yes. All praise and glory be to baby Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I got my low interest rate. I'm locked in for 30 years and I'm hoping to pay this bad boy off early. You know what I mean? I don't want, yeah. I don't, I don't want to be every month dealing with that monthly payment coming right. in. Mm -hmm. I want to be king of the casa around <laughs> here. You know what I mean? Like the only one that's getting in my pocket is the government because they're like my twin brother. You know what I mean? They just have access to my bank account. Here's another letter. We already debited it. Oh, oh. my God. My oh. twin brother. <laughs> when do I get to keep some of this money? I know, right? <laughs> oh, that twin brother of yours. That's twin so Twin brother, funny. Uncle Sam. <laughs> It's Sam and Brian hard at work today. Oh, well, actually, Uncle Sam's got the day off. Right? He's, Brian's the one working. COVID mask free hanging down at the beach with all the girls down there. And I'm over here stuck Slaving in the office. Away. Yes. Working my little tushy off. Oh, oh, man. That is funny. It's terrible. You know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, man, it is. I'm always like, what with my accountant? I'm like, really? I was like, all right. You know, well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. It's like, one of the few things that's certain in life. Mm -hmm. We just uh, got to hope that they do good things with our money. Unfortunately, they have not. That's yeah. why we have so many problems here in Illinois. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. be real. Let's talk real talk for a minute, but then let's stop because we don't want to go down that path. Well, I was going to say, I was like, <laughs> you're going to go, go a rabbit path. hole. You're gonna, no, we're you, not we, gonna we were just there. so excited and happy a minute yes, ago, okay? <laughs> Up with hope, down with the government. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, for everybody listening, you're an immigration attorney. Mm hmm And um, what, what, what got you, what motivated you to do that? How did you get into the immigration law? Um, well, I feel like the area of law that I was uh, trying to decide on shifted over time, you know, when before I started law school, I was thinking labor, uh, labor law, defending workers' rights. Uh, mainly a lot of that came from just experiences of what I saw my mom go through as an employee and as a worker, and that kind of stunned my passion to want to protect uh, employees and workers and defend their rights. And then went to law school with that idea in mind, took a class, took an internship. I was like, this is not for me. I hate this class. I hate this internship. So then I switched, I did fair housing. And then I was like, tenant rights. I'm all about, you know, protecting the tenants. And then that shifted. Then it was like, oh, maybe I'll think about criminal defense. I did criminal defense for a year part-time with, um, with a solo practitioner. That was great, but it was very exhausting. Like that year, it just so exhausting that I just didn't see myself living that type of lifestyle long term. Um, but during that process, I was starting my practice anyway, um, and I had already decided I was gonna focus on immigration law. Decided to go that route because I wanted to pick an area that I could um, service the Latino community. You know, my parents immigrated here from Mexico when they were young. Um, they actually went through the immigration process when I was really young, so I don't remember a lot of what they went through, but they were able to um, gain lawful status through the amnesty back in like the 80s and then become citizens. And so seeing that and then also family members of mine, some of which are still undocumented. So I felt like that's something that I can relate to. It's something that I'm really supporting the Latino community. Immigration is huge within the Latino community. I'm bilingual. So I really wanted to use my background, my skills, and really focus in that area because I thought that's where I could make the most difference, right? And this was um, after working in criminal defense for about this a year? Was, no, this was, so this was right when I graduated. Because when yeah. I graduated, I started my practice. Uh, I actually started my law firm through the Chicago Bar Foundation Justice Entrepreneurs Project. So awesome. through JEP, um, when we were writing our application, I had to decide, okay, what did I want to focus on? And that's when I was kind of debating, all right, what do I do? Do I do tenant work? Do I do criminal work? Do I do what? And then I also talked a bit with my mom, and she's like, do immigration, like that, consider that. And then I was like, you know what, yeah. So then I decided to focus on uh, tenant rights and immigration. And then slowly, I really just ended up focusing on immigration. I don't do a lot of uh, tenant work or landlord work. Um, that kind of shifted away a little bit. But when I was applying for the program, those were the areas that I decided to focus on. 
And then as soon as I started doing immigration work, like, yeah, I just fell in love with it. And even to this day, I, I every time I get an approval in the mail, I am just as excited as I as the first one I ever got. It's just a very rewarding um, area where you're really helping families, you know, um, you're giving them peace of mind, security, freedom, and turning something negative into a positive, right? And so it makes it, it's very fulfilling. So even when I'm working long hours, it doesn't it doesn't feel like work or it can be stressful obviously but it's a stress that i can manage and well worth it because in the end whenever i work hard on any case it always get good results and then this family is able to stay here stay together and not be worried anymore and so sometimes i feel like i get approvals in the perfect timings because sometimes i'll have so many deadlines and i am so stressed and i'm working and i'm working and then I go to the office, check the mail, and here's another approval. And I'm like, yes. And then that just kind of gives me that boost of motivation to keep working hard, right? Um, and I've also noticed how important it is for um, these individuals to be able to speak with a Spanish-speaking attorney, someone that they can relate to and communicate directly with, because sometimes there could there could be a lot of misunderstandings uh, due to the language barriers, right? Maybe the interpreter didn't fully interpret. Like, I've seen many times interpreters it try to interpret i'm like that is not what they said like you you use a different word and that can really make a difference on a person's case right immigration law can be very particular so if we don't really have the right understanding about their immigration history we may go the wrong route right or we may apply for something that maybe they should not have even done to begin with and so I uh, definitely feel like I need to stay in this area to make sure that I also utilize just being bilingual to make sure that my clients get the best service possible and that I'm not exposing them to any risk just by applying. I've, you know, immigration in America, you've had generations of immigration, Polish, Irish, Italian, Chinese, it seems that this is the time of the Mexican people. Mm -hmm. This is their time now for immigration. So I was watching a uh, continuing education video from an mm -hmm. immigration attorney within the last few weeks, and she was saying, like, most of her clients were Mexican. And she, I don't know if she was bilingual or not. I know she didn't really mention it in the video. But I can imagine, just to make sure that things are not lost in communication, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that it's very helpful that you speak Spanish. And mm -hmm. I'm learning Spanish. I'm in the process. Oh, great. Yes. And, I mean, most of my clients are are spanish-speaking clients mm -hmm. or mexican clients and so my my staff you know they speak fluent spanish okay great but i'm still learning myself but it does help because a lot of the time they're maybe a little reluctant to use my services mm -hmm. even though we're, we're able to help them we've done this plenty right. of times but it, it's very helpful eventually right. i want to be that white dude attorney who can speak spanish yes and, and, you're and gonna get there that's awesome i am for sure i'm working on it right now <laughs> i um i was like let's start talking some spanish right now no i'm not you can I'm put like, me on the spot we'll <laughs> i'm not gonna put happens. you on the spot <laughs> no i the other thing too is not just like being able to communicate is being able to just a build a relationship with your client you know i feel like immigration law is something that you need you need trust right you need trust so that the person feels comfortable enough to tell you all the information and sometimes if they don't have that trust then or maybe they just you didn't ask all the questions enough that they didn't realize that something about their history was important for the case and they just didn't say it because you didn't ask the question, right? Or you didn't ask for that information. But I feel like my my background and being able to talk with them, I always, I always with every single one of my clients, I build relationships with. One of my clients, we've been working with her case for uh, such a long time that she's like, man, when we first met, my daughter was like this old. Now you can be my, you can be the godmother of my daughter. Like we have such close. You got that close? Uh, yeah. Like we. That's close. And you so. <laughs> I'm going to name you the godmother of my children. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I appreciate that because I feel like I want that. I want, I want my clients to come in the door and feel like they, that they're not intimidated, that I'm just another person here just to help them through the process. So when I talk with them, when I meet with them, I'm, I'm a, it's a very casual atmosphere. And when we're working on their cases, whenever we talk about or take statements and we're talking about their life or their background, I'll also plug in things of like my family. Like they'll mention things. I'm like, oh, my mom does that too. Or, oh yeah, my dad does 
that too or you know things that are similar and then we start having like conversations engaging learning about each other but obviously there's there's boundaries right like I also have to make sure that I don't get too close to my clients right close enough to build a good client attorney relationship and that's what I want I want to give them a good experience so that we make sure that their case is handled fully and that they have enough trust to make sure to tell me completely everything and feel comfortable and have enough trust to feel that they can make an input in their case right because at the end of the day we're a team I always tell my clients we're a team just because I know the law and I'm the attorney doesn't mean that like I make I, I make all the decision makings, right? This is your case. I'm helping you with this case and we're working together. I know the law. You know your history and your background and everything. And we have to come together in order to build a solid case, right? So I try to educate them on the law in a way that they can understand it so that we can strategize together. Obviously, I'm going to give them my recommendations of what's best but in the end of the day we have to come to some type of agreement when handling their case and i feel like having that communication having that relationship allows us to kind of do that right um so i really i love having a good client attorney relationship and all my clients always mention how it's so different they've interacted with other attorneys for other matters and it just feels always very serious and like uptight and like they're always so nervous to go to talk to the attorney or they don't feel like they can say anything they have to just you know listen to whatever the attorney is doing or saying whereas when they come to my office it's like you're just coming to see an attorney but you're you're uh in a welcoming space where you're free to like engage and talk and be casual yeah i mean knowing the the facts of the client situation well is really the key to making a diagnosis whether you're right. a doctor or your attorney mm -hmm. and so yeah being able to communicate them and, and have them feel comfortable being honest with you too mm -hmm. because there's so many aspects of our lives you know as human beings that we don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing mm -hmm. so and especially if you come from I'm a pretty open and honest individual. I always try mm -hmm. to keep it real. Yeah, you know right. I mean? But not everybody, some people have been raised where their parents tell them, like, no, you don't share these private details, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. But if you put garbage into a calculator, you get garbage out. So if mm -hmm. people are giving us garbage information or it's incomplete or inaccurate right. or not the full truth or whatever, like, that can mm -hmm. hinder us to, to help them. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and it also, I think, also has to do with personality. Like, I'm just a very you know, chill, easygoing person, let's just talk, you know, and um, it doesn't ever feel like pressure or like serious. Um, so I think that also has to do with it too, personality, language, how, how the environment, the setting you set up in your, in your practice. For sure, and you know, it was funny when you mentioned um, that, that you were into like workers' rights um, law, and that's that's exactly what motivated me to go to law school in the first. Oh, place. really? Yeah, it, but it did change as well. You mm -hmm. know, like when I when I got into law school, I was very much into workers' rights. My dad was an electrician by trade. Lord rest his hardworking Irish soul. Mm -hmm. um, you you know, I wanted to help people like him. You know, like that was my passion. I was like, if I can make make it possible for more people to live like dad, like we'll have a better place. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We'll all have a better life. And uh, I was very passionate about that when I got in. And I, I did do labor law classes and things like that. And don't get me wrong, you know, I I still have a passion for workers' rights in the sense that, like, the pressure in the workplace is against the worker. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of take it or leave it, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of leverage. Things have changed a little bit in the service industry with COVID and everything now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's been a labor shortage or having mm -hmm. a hard time fill, having workers fill these positions for many different reasons. There's always a million factors that influence what we are seeing. You know, childcare is very expensive. So mm -hmm. it's not just that people want to absorb, uh, you know, the the government benefits that are out there right now. It's just that if we go back for that wage, like your kids are still at home school right. and they, they're not even in school yet. So it costs right. so much money to have somebody to be there. And, and, and just, but also, yeah, then we see what government action may be doing that's like a disincentive to actually work. Like, well, why am I gonna go back and risk getting COVID for yeah. 500, 600 a week when I can be getting 900 on right. unemployment? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's been really crazy times with all that. But come back, I guess, you know, my, my dad was was a was a working working person and we came from a working class family. And uh, that was that was what I got into to law school for. But then I, the one, person that shifted me toward like business and transactional stuff was mm -hmm. julie spanbauer oh yeah professor she's spanbauer great. yes 
Did I you didn't have her, her class. No? no, I didn't have her, but I always heard good things. Yeah, she's um, she was in terms of like overall thinking or like teaching you how to think like a lawyer or to analyze something or to dissect it in a you know you know regimented format. Like she was so good at that. Mm. And then contracts also like the entire life we live is governed by contracts mm -hmm. basically like this whole society we have is a social agreement and then all the things we do like your home purchase mine mm -hmm. here it's all governed by a roadmap of a contract right. and i just got so into that did you ever take professor acevedo's class because he did, did contracts not. and he also did corporations he was one of the most popular people oh, he was contracts. he always got like a, a professor of the, the year, year award i loved him i had him for both contracts and corporations it's great I don't think I could even get in because I would always ask, like, do um, you remember Julian Crozier? I think. Yeah, Julian. We still, I just talked to him, like, last week. He's, mm -hmm. a, he's a good friend of mine. We went to grade school together. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, we grew up, like, from, like, seven or eight years old all the way until oh. we graduated. And then he went, he was at John Marshall one year before I got there as well. Oh, that's awesome. Small world. I'm going to ask him to be on. Well, I, I did ask him earlier today if he mm -hmm. would want to come on, him and his one of his law partners, because I think mm -hmm. there's three attorneys at his firm. But he's one of the people I want to speak with next. Yeah, he's chat. great. We were just talking. Yes, he started his own practice, too, because he was a state's attorney, yeah. and then now he's doing criminal defense. I definitely refer out to him too, or he'll call me with immigration questions and vice versa. So, yeah, we still stay in contact. He's such a good guy. He's super intelligent. He's funny. Like, oh yeah, he's so goddamn funny. Because when we were kids, he seemed like he was like on this journey, figuring out where the destination was. He's he he knows like he's a man's man. He reminds <laughs> me of his father. His father used to be our basketball coach. Oh yeah, and like yeah, he, I love Julian. Julian's a good dude, and I, I look forward to having him on. I could chat with him too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and it's cool that you guys have that overlap probably with practices. Mm -hmm. Or like, hey, I think I might have some criminal stuff right. going on here, but mm -hmm. also, or if it's immigration, it's the other right. way around. Right, you know? exactly. I love the the network you've established at John Marshall. You know, I feel like I'm still in contact with many colleagues. Even now, it doesn't even feel like we've graduated because I think now it's going to be for me eight years. Yeah. Eight years. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but time flies and I'm still in contact with people and it's great. You just build such great relationships. And now it's great because now we're in the practice and now we can like, you know, um, support each other, refer, ask questions, bounce ideas. So, Yeah, I feel like we've gotten our ass kicked for like the last seven, eight years where... But you went to practice right away. Right, yeah. I literally, as soon as I got sworn in, I started the practice. On your own? Yeah, well, through the JEP program. So it wasn't, like, completely on my own. I actually, you know, it's funny, I never even thought I would ever start my own business. I always felt like I'm not a business person. I don't want to deal with, like, money or be, like, trying to get clients and hustling. Like, that's just not me. I really honestly wanted to just work for legal aid, service low and moderate income communities, and get a paycheck and do what I love and just have a, you know, decent life, right? I didn't envision myself being like this attorney working for a big top law firm in a big building and making a ton of money. That's not why I went to law school. I went to just help because I love this, I love the law and I want to make a difference. And then when I was graduating, there wasn't a lot of opportunities with legal aid. You know, there was some fellowships, but, you know, although I wasn't trying to make a lot of money, I also needed to have some type of living, you know. And so I felt like what was being paid with these fellowships was just so little. So I didn't apply for fellowships and I was trying to get some like staff attorney positions at legal aid, but there weren't a lot. It was mainly like fellowship opportunities. So then luckily, I feel like everything happens for a reason, and I was blessed that um, during that time, the JP program had just started. Like, that summer was the first time, the first class they were admitting, and they were doing it every six months. I thought it was, it was like, just that one class, and I was like, oh, I'm studying for the bar, and you had to be licensed to join the program. You could apply before, but you couldn't be in the program until you were licensed, so I thought I lost my opportunity until they told me, no, we, are, we do it every six months. We're going to be doing it every six months. So then by the time I finished with the bar, passed, I applied, and then as soon as I was sworn in in uh, ha Halloween, actually, my sworn in was uh, Halloween, then uh, we started the program, which was great. I um, When I saw it, uh, the description about it, I liked that it felt like it was a legal aid kind of like mission where you're servicing low and moderate income communities. They started the program because there was just such a 
big gap of people that either didn't qualify for legal aid or they did, but legal aid didn't have enough capacity or um, and they couldn't afford uh, billable hours and high uh, paying attorneys. So they decided to fill this gap by creating uh, JP to be able to help young attorneys start their own private practices, but with the mission of supporting low and moderate income communities. So the way we structure our bill, our, our fees, it's not billable hours. We try to steer away from billable hours and instead try to focus more on flat fees, offering alternative ways of like paying to be able to make it accessible for someone, right? So at the same time, we're not being like pro bono or low bono. We are also earning, you know, a decent living, but we're also being available and accessible to this gap of individuals that can't get services, right? And so when I was reading that, I thought, this is great because it's, it's what I want to do, but now I just do it on my own. And you had to fill out an application describing what will your firm look like? What's your vision of it? So when I started doing that and actually started thinking about it, because I had never really thought about it before, I got so excited. I'm thinking, like, I can basically do whatever I want with my practice. If I have an idea or if I have a program I want to do, if I want to shift something, I can do that and I won't be limited by legal aid, whether they have limitations on their funding or whether I even have time or whether I have to run it by my supervisor. So just thinking of the possibilities of being able to have no limitations on what I can do with my skills and with my knowledge, I, I then just got blown away and got super excited about starting a practice. So then I applied and I was fortunate that I got into the program. And then they helped me. They helped me with uh, the business side of it. Like they would um, partner you with a legal aid organization for six months. So you were doing casework uh, supervised, but it was pro bono work. So you had to do like 20 hours a week pro bono for six months so that someone's supervising you while you're doing the casework. And then the other half was going to weekly meetings where they would teach us, okay, how do you establish your entity, um, picking an accountant, doing all the other things you don't learn in law school. So I felt like the guidance that they provided was sufficient enough for me to start a practice, even though I just got out of law school. And I figured right now is the time. I don't have a house or a mortgage or any big commitments. I'm single. I don't got kids or a family. If it doesn't work, well, it didn't work. And I will apply to a firm or, you know, do what everyone else does. But if it does, then I will never have to rely on anyone else. And luckily it did. I've had my practice for eight years now, and I'm so happy it's it continues to grow and it allows me to adjust with the times too you know so when i started it was the biden i mean the obama administration then it was trump and during that administration it was just got awful but i was able to do different things like do know your rights workshops address things with daca like adjust what i'm doing based on what's going on with our immigration laws at that time and then now, you know, we're under a much better administration. So now I'm kind of readjusting to other things. So I feel like having my practice allows me to do all those different things uh, with the community that I address the needs in that time of what's going on. So for, for everybody listening, the Chicago Bar Association has this program. And it sounds like you're saying like JP, but it's JEP, -E Just, Justice, Justice Entrepreneur Project. Project. So for all the listeners, that is a program from the Chicago Bar Association where young lawyers like ourselves can be part of that program and kind of learn how to run a law practice under the supervision of other attorneys or clinics or whatever mm -hmm. have you or law firms in order for you to be able to go out there on your own mm -hmm. and to represent clients on your own. Well, the legal aid organizations aren't supervising you with your practice. You're just kind of being a, a pro bono attorney, volunteer attorney yeah. with them to be able to get that that casework supervision initially. And then after that, you know, it's only the six months and then you're on your own. Well, it's a good program because mm -hmm. for most like different educational things in life, including law school, they teach you the substance of it. Right. We learn the substance of what is law, what are people's rights. What are their obligations under law? How do we defend their rights and obligations or whatever we're doing? But they don't teach us how to run a business. They don't right. teach us any of this. Mm -hmm. You got all this student debt. You got to get out there. You got to start working or whatever. I mean, depending, I don't know if mm -hmm. you're like mad scholarship or something. I No, I, I still got that. One. You know, I graduated with a mortgage and no house at that time. Yes. 
<laughs> I don't. I, I felt like I was the only one saying, I'm like, I got a mortgage and no house. Oh, man, I don't know no, I say it all the time. What, but yes, that's good. Because that's is. what it is. You got a mortgage and no house. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know. I think the legal reasoning behind not being able to discharge your or get rid of your student loan debt is because you can foreclose on a house and get that back if you're the bank, but you can't foreclose on that now. Right. Like somebody said. So once right. it's in there, they're not letting you declare bankruptcy right. and get rid of it. You're stuck with it until death do us part, <laughs> and then your family doesn't have to pay your debt anymore or uh -huh. whatever the agreements are, depending on whether you have government loans or private loans. Government loans are more favorable. Uh -huh. yes, so that's I why was, I've stuck with mine. I've like, stuck with mine, too. The mm -hmm. government's juicing me in taxes, but at least those student loan terms are favorable. <laughs> yeah. I've, had to, I've had to sell my future away in order to get an education. It's, yeah, it's an investment in yourself, though. You know, we wouldn't sure. be able to do what we're doing now that we love without that investment. So I just see it as a, you know, a monthly payment I'll pay for until I get old. <laughs> I'd rather pay off other other things such as my house and my condo before I pay off these student loans. They could just, you know, keep paying, paying, paying. We'll, we'll get there one day. There's this comedian, Neil Brennan, who worked with Dave Chappelle when he had the Chappelle show. He was the, he was one of the writers and he also does stand up comedy himself. And he has this special on Netflix where he's like, he's like, yeah, I don't have the money for you now, but I can give you $80 a month for the next 300 years. <laughs> and that's pretty much what student loans are. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? They, the debt used to be real, but now it's kind of like, do you really expect people to be able to pay all of this off in the future? What, what mm -hmm. is going on here? It's not. It's not. So I was like, once I'm done paying off my condo and my house, okay, then maybe we'll think about that. But I'm, I'm not in a rush to. Yeah. Well, we'll address it. It's a loan. It's a monthly payment for a long time. For a long time. Well, uh, bless the uh, JEP program. Yes. I. For me, I had tried various different jobs. I was, uh, originally I wanted to go into more like corporate law and things when I got out of law school before I started my own practice. And then I was very close to working for a judge. I was very close to getting a staff attorney position out in DuPage. I wanted to work for a judge to kind of, it's prestigious, right? Mm -hmm. You work for a judge, you make connections for law firms, you mm -hmm. get to learn how all sides of the, the you know, the parties thinks and right. on the cases, the plaintiff defense, the judge, how they're gonna analyze it. I did that for a while. I, I was so close on a staff attorney position out in DuPage. And then one of my friends from John Marshall, he was part of the like Italian student uh, association. And he said, hey, I got an email for this law firm on the north side, and they're looking for attorneys. He says, you know, I know you're not part of the Italian students or whatever, but maybe you want to apply. Mm -hmm. And I did. And, um, you know, shout out to Vincent Copero from my graduating class. He's always been a dude who's kind of pushed me in the right direction on a right. lot of things. So he... Got me this job and I kind of saw, you know, what was the workflow like inside a law firm. And I, I worked there, I was planning on working there for about a year or two and I only worked there for like three months and, oh. then, I, and then I started my own shop. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, in this area, I was renting for a little while and eventually I got here and this is my anchor, my, my home base now. So mm -hmm. but there's my point, I guess, for saying all that was just to say that there's so many things they don't tell you in law school about yeah. keeping your books and running a business and yeah. how all this goddamn paperwork is going to kill you. Yeah. I don't have time to just <laughs> solve the problems of the day with these clients and then I still know. be able to take care of my own shit I and know. get all the stuff ready for the tax man and all this stuff <laughs> or whatever I got to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's when you start outsourcing. <laughs> I do my best. Like, we all have our little grooves yeah. in this office. Mm -hmm. The first desk is Stephanie. She works with the buyer clients that I work with. Okay. The second desk is Rocio, although I steal that all the time. <laughs> That's Rocio's desk. She works with the seller clients. And then my wife steals my desk. <laughs> and um, sh she does a lot of the data entry and the core, like helping people out with emails or doing mm -hmm. modifications to the contracts in the form of an addendum or whatever. Uh -huh. And does all this stuff. So that we can have a podcast day, yes. so we can sit down and talk to each other <laughs> like human beings. I know. I I'm telling you, like, there's so much that you would have to do, and I'm, that's why the first two years I had like no life still because I was trying to launch this business, and it takes so much time. And I wanted to make sure that I gave it my all before to make sure that whether it was gonna work or not. Right? I didn't want to just give it a little bit and then hope that over time it'll grow. No, I was like, I gotta do really good the first two years. And, um, but then that also caused the work burnout, you know, and I was like, okay, that's it. The, the business is fine. It's solid. We're stable. Now I need to 
develop a good lifestyle, good work-life balance. And then after two years, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to start lowering down my hours again and try to outsource and try to figure out how to manage um, the practice. But I love it. It's it's for me, right? Like I'm not working and busting my butt for somebody else, especially when you work for other individuals. You see, this is how much you're charging the client. This is how much I'm getting paid and I'm doing all the work. I couldn't do that for that long. I was like, no, I only had that uh, part time job just temporarily because I was just out of law school. I still needed to have some type of income coming right. in. We all do. Yeah. So I was like, I don't have any clients and I'm just starting the practice and I just finished school, got sworn in. I need to have a side job to at least pay the bills while I'm building the practice. So that's why I worked at the criminal defense firm for a year just to have that as paying my bills as I build the practice. And luckily, all that hard work within a year, you know, paid off that I was able to quit that part time and make both that money plus mine and be okay just on my own after that and having gone back. I love it. I can can never see myself working for anybody else. Yeah, now that I've worked for myself, I don't think I would be able to work within that structure because I feel like I am the manager and I that's what I do is manage now. So I don't need anybody to manage me. I mm-hmm. can I manage things. Mm-hmm. Um, you How know, long have you had your uh, firm? May 2016 is when I first started oh, okay. my firm. So, so like yeah. five years? Yeah, just my five anniversary. Five yeah, year anniversary last Christmas. month. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 October is mine. Well, October is the grand opening. I mean, when I, November is when it started. March was when I incorporated. And then come October, I was like, okay, I'm going to do a grand opening. Once I quit the part time, I was like, I'm going to do a grand opening. Had a blast. And so I always say, like, October is my grand opening anniversary yeah you kind of pick one and use it as like the yeah main, right the main, the main <laughs> thing they have in. yeah no um the through the cba through the jep you did you build a lot of your business that way where you were able to have like a good amount of clients coming in where you didn't so have to worry about they things? they didn't bring in my clients so they would they we have a referral system within the jep but I don't really get many clients through that referral system. Um, I build a lot of my client base from referrals with community organizations. So um, working legal aid actually also refers a lot to me. So I'm on several referral lists within legal aid. So I'll get referrals from those lists and then um, just networking and doing workshops in the community. So I started to do a lot of community engagement early on in the first two years. Uh, for two reasons one is i want to be out in the community i want to one of the things i wanted to do was be doing outreach work at the fair housing clinic is actually where i learned it so when i was in have you did you ever intern at the fair housing clinic? i did not i okay. have friends who did i, I did not so one of the things that we had to do as part of our uh internship there was do an outreach program and educate communities about fair housing discrimination and their rights and so I really fell in love with doing that, with educating communities. So I definitely wanted to incorporate that into my business when I launched it. So then I started to reach out to a lot of colleagues that were a part of community organizations or my networks, and then just organizations that I started volunteering with and building relationships. So through those and doing those community outreach workshops, I started to get you know build my reputation and get um, referrals. So a lot of my referrals actually come from the community, uh, whether that's advocates or organizations, and then some from like attorneys, but a majority of it comes from there. And then, and then the other big piece comes from my actual clients. So I'll be the immigration attorney for some of my clients and their entire families. And any time anyone new comes into the country or they're trying to bring another family member into it, I'm like their go-to, like call Daisy, right? Um, so I have many clients that I know all of their family members um, and so they started building from there. My clients just referring me because of the service, the quality of service that they got. They realized it's very different working with me than with other individuals that they've worked with, and they like that experience. And so they, I'm always the the one person that they think about. And um, so that's where another big part of my client base came from. So that's how I started to generate referrals, and it's just built from there. Um, Another reason why I wanted to connect with community organizations was not just to do workshops, because I wanted to learn how do they run, what do they do, how do they function. I'm hoping in the future, I don't plan to be an attorney until I retire, I plan on also doing community work. So I'm hoping to launch some type of community center I don't know if it'll be a nonprofit or if it'll be part of the practice as an extension to the firm. 
Um, so I'm trying to kind of get more information, build those networks and those connections so that when the time comes that I am ready to shift careers and do more of that, I can have some like information to kind of structure what I want to build. Sounds good. We're going to pause there for just a moment. We'll be right back with okay. you. Okay, sounds great. Okay, we're back recording. Back to business. Yes. So what areas of immigration law do you focus on or do you handle? Mm -hmm. So um, two big areas. Uh, I mainly focus on like family petitions. Um, so that's adjustment of status, either doing your green card process in the United States or consular processing, doing it abroad or a combination of both. Um, consular processing and within the United States depending on the case so helping a lot of families um, within families I work a lot with like married couples spouses petitioning for spouses or um, children petitioning for their parents uh, are the two of the main family members I work with and then another a big component is working with uh, victims of crimes so doing a lot of U visa petitions for individuals that are victims of crimes the U visa provides a series of different crimes that people are eligible for. The ones I work with most frequently is individuals who have been victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, rape, um, robberies, uh, assaults. And then aside from that, I also work with um, individuals who are eligible for DACA. So whether that's initial DACA, renewals, advanced parole on DACA. Um, I also do some asylum work and um, deportation. So deportation, I do have to limit that uh, because of the extensive work that goes into that. I can't take too many deportation cases at once, um, but I do do uh, different deportation cases on different matters. And uh, that's, those are the, the main areas. The only areas I don't focus on within immigration is employment visas and student visas. So anything other than those, I would mostly handle, but the ones I just described are the main ones I see more frequently. Adjustment of status, mm -hmm. U visa for people who need to be here because they are victims of crimes where they are from. No, where the, the crime occurred in the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then also, the last one would be deportation if you're just representing, yeah. trying to make sure that everything is fair in the process of, if you are being deported, at least... Well, defending them against deportation. To try to make sure that they can stay, but right. it, it mm -hmm. always... Who knows how it's going to work right. out. Right. So once someone is in deportation proceedings, then I represent them to try to defend them against deportation to allow them to remain in the United States. And we talk about petitioning mm -hmm. and defending mm -hmm. um, against deportations. You are petitioning the courts of the United States of America. Who, who do you file? The, or the, so, the, the agency of you know, immigration agency here mm -hmm. in America, who, are, who do you petition? So the uh, individual who's being, so I'm representing the respondent, the individual who's undocumented, trying to remain in the United States. We're filing petitions before the courts. So it's EOIR, Executive Office of Immigration. Um, and then, so everything gets done with the court, right? Um, so there's the a specific trial. branch of the court for immigration. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's... Ed Immigration law, is ad, it's an administrative proceeding, so there are administrative hearings before an immigration judge. So it's not a full-blown judge, it's kind of like, it's an almost ad, like a judge? It is a judge, it's an immigration judge, but it's an administrative judge. It's an it's administrative hearings. Okay, and what what is the, does that mean really anything different just, between, a, just, between uh, going with a regular federal judge? Right, so it's different in terms of like the rules and what's done and like you don't have a jury, right? It's just the prosecutor on behalf of the government. Oh my God, we almost lost power there. What I happened? Know. I was like, what happened? And then you have the immigration judge and then you have me representing the respondent. And so depending on the case, we can be working with USCIS, which is the offices that are in charge of reviewing petitions, or we can be filing actual cases before the judge. So it depends on the case, whether we're doing a combination of both. Um, but essentially, they're in deportation court trying to defend themselves against deportation, presenting a defense. So I'm with them presenting a defense, which their defense has to be immigration relief. They have to be eligible for immigration relief, some type of uh, um, 
eligibility that gives them lawful status to stay here. If they're not eligible for some type of immigration status, then they will be ordered deported because they have no lawful status. Unless, which brings me to my point on some of the new things that were announced, right, is if someone is not eligible for anything, they don't have any family members, they don't qualify for asylum, they haven't been here very long, whatever the reason is that they are just not eligible for absolutely no relief, right? And their only option is then requesting voluntary departure to go back as opposed to having an order of deportation. Um, we also have another thing called... Um, prosecutorial discretion where we can ask for we just call it PD we can ask for PD to be able to ask that this person remain here because they are not a priority under the list of priorities every priority changes with administration so the Trump administration was terrible basically everyone was a priority under that administration so we weren't able to ask for discretion from the government to terminate their case um, if they weren't eligible for relief. So we had to make sure that the person was eligible for relief for them to be able to stay here. Otherwise, they would have to have a voluntary departure because they're not eligible for anything. And right now the government is not providing prosecutorial discretion. Now it's available, which is great. It's so exciting. A lot of us are, you know, checking our cases and seeing what can we do with this new trend that's happening. So the Biden administration initially in like his first week or two, he changed the priorities. So he listed the priorities, and the priorities is what tells ICE how are they going, who are they going to look for, who are they going to arrest, who are they searching for, um, who, it also tells the um, prosecutors who do they initiate charges against to uh, start deportation proceedings, and then also um, tells uh, while the case, if the case is already pending um, before the court, then it says whether they're eligible for PD or not based on the priorities. So the priori priorities are very important. Now, with the Biden administration, he limit the priorities. Now, the only people who are a priority are people who are a national, who are a threat to the national security, people who are recent arrivals. So there's a specific date of November 1st, 2020. And anyone who arrived after that date or were uh, not physically present before November 1st, 2020 would then be deemed uh, priority so those are more recent arrivals and then the last is a uh, public safety so anyone who has aggravated felonies or has been associated with gangs that they deem will pose a threat to uh, the public safety right so those are the only three priorities which is great because it's a very limited list so anyone who's been here for a long time has not had any issues doesn't have crimes um, they can ask for process, for PD. They can ask for discretion to terminate the proceedings, even if they're not eligible for anything, because they are not deemed a priority. Now, it's not to say that they're they're going to be granted it, right? But they have the option to be able to request that, right? Whereas before Trump, we couldn't request anything. Everybody was a priority. His list was just all inclusive. Obama administration had a priority list, but it wasn't as limited as Biden. He he did limit it also just to criminals and people that he felt would be a threat but his list was still a bit longer biden's list and list of priorities is much more like narrow and limited so that gives us a lot of a lot of ability to ask and defend people against deportation right and then it also helps um individuals who are not even in proceedings to have some peace of mind that if they're not a priority that they might ice might not be looking for them. Whereas before, under the Trump administration, I would have people contacting me that they're in court and they have no crimes, no nothing. They just happened for some reason or another, they were targeted, right? Um, and that was really unfortunate when we would have families that they've been here for a long time, have no record and are trying to, you know, just be here good doing what they're supposed to do and not get in trouble with the law. And then they just get picked up, right? Um, so I'm really excited about this new trend, about the priorities changing. It allows me to give people just peace of mind um, and give people options who are already in proceedings. And that's really good, too, because then it will try to address the backlog we have in immigration court. There are just, I think, over, I think I read over a million people in proceedings. Now, it's such a huge amount of people that it's difficult to get through these cases in deportation court. Sometimes these cases will last years. 
And so this will also address the backlog. It will also address the how ICE and these agencies utilize their resources, right? To utilize their resources more effectively, actually targeting the individuals who pose a threat to our country, as opposed to just individuals who are here with their families trying to, you know, uh, have the American dream. And so then um, the other thing that just uh, happened, so Biden issued the priorities, but there also needs guidance. There's memos that come out from the different agencies talking about how they are enforcing that, right? Um, and what are they going to be doing? At that time when he listed the priorities, we still didn't have um, guidance on how we can request prosecutorial discretion. So uh, now it just recently came out. So all of us are really excited because we've been waiting for this memo to give us this guidance so that we can try to figure out which of our cases we are gonna ask for discretion. How can we do that? Because they have to tell us, give us further guidance on where to submit, how to submit, and what they're considering. And so that recently came out, I believe it was this week or last week it came out. Uh, we're still waiting on additional guidance because the memo came out, but they still need to kind of figure out how they're structuring internally here in Chicago. So they, at least from what they told us, to wait till at least the end of June, they're figuring out their protocols and all the before we actually start submitting our requests. But then after that, I'm definitely taking note right now, reviewing all my cases to see which of my clients would really benefit from this recent uh, list of priorities and will benefit from the prosecutorial discretion and see what options they have. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I think that's, you know, it's really going to help a lot of my clients, a lot of uh, uh, people moving forward. Um, and yeah. I'm sorry, I gave you a ton of information, right? I am going to ask about a lot of different things within that information, just so that the anybody listening, whether it's People that are friends with me on Facebook or just listeners in general know um, what it all means and, and how the clients can use it for benefit mm -hmm. or how they can contact you mm -hmm. or even another immigration attorney I guess in that sense we are helping the greater cause mm -hmm. of um, you know just information for mm -hmm. people to know so I would say like mm -hmm. you know to sum up everything I just said if anyone if anyone is in deportation court right now in deportation proceedings the first thing to do if you don't have an attorney is try to consult with an attorney to figure out is there are you eligible for something may is prosecutorial discretion maybe an option for you for anyone who is in proceedings has an attorney already maybe discuss that maybe try to bring up hey has anything new happened that may be able to help my case so bring it up to your attorney to see if maybe the you guys will st switch strategies depending on the case maybe they already have a strong case an option this is not a good option for them right but I would just say just keep in mind that there is new priorities now there is now prosecutorial discretion that's available so to consider that in terms of uh, that being an option for them if they're in court and then um, the other thing that I was uh, gonna mention too was if anyone is in deportation court, a deportation proceedings, and they don't have an attorney, and they're not sure what's going on with their case, we're, we've been in COVID, right? So the courthouse shut down during COVID. They, uh, are, oh, they only started doing limited things, mainly trials, um, but the status court dates, which is called master calendar hearings, those are still not um, open yet. So as soon as that becomes open, then people who don't have trials will start going back to the courthouse to go before the judge check in and you know continue their case. So if anyone right now is in deportation court and they ha they don't have an attorney and they have a, a court date coming up, I would recommend that they call a 1-800 number. There is a 1-800 number that you contact um, that you can put your A number and you can see, do you have a court date? I would recommend calling at least once a week to keep checking on that status because many times the courthouse when they send a notice telling them when their next date is or when if it got canceled, that notice can take a long time and they might not even get the notice. It may get lost in the mail. So there's always a number, a 1-800 number that they can call to be able to check their case. So do that and not to worry uh, about their cases because right now there is no uh, master calendar hearings unless you're represented by an attorney. Those who do have attorneys, we as attorneys have certain protocols now of what we still have to do remotely. Um, but anyone who doesn't, keep in mind to consult with an attorney, to call that 1-800 number, and keep checking on things. When people come to you for your assistance, help me out, 
Do people come to you where they're already in proceedings or before that to try to head off the problem? Um, for the most part, when they're already in proceedings, when they come beforehand, it really depends on what they're eligible for, right? So the first thing I do with anyone, whether they're in proceedings or not, is we set up a consultation. So I don't, I can't assess someone's case without having a consultation. And my consultations are pretty thorough. They're about an hour long for everyone. I feel like five, 30 minutes, it's not enough time. So I right. usually spend an hour to make sure I go through their immigration history. So we start off with confidentiality and make sure that they understand that everything we discuss is confidential so we can talk um, privately. And then we go through all of the legal questions to make sure I understand their immigration history and then determine based on the, that, what are they eligible for, right? And if they're not eligible for anything, then inform them of their rights, how to protect themselves against being stopped by ICE or detained by ICE. Unfortunately, if they're not eligible for any type of relief, uh, for any type of petition to gain lawful status, there's not much then I could do other than inform them of their rights to protect themselves. And then if God forbid, they do end up being picked up by ICE or are detained, then they call me and then I can represent them in court. But I can't do anything other than uh, help them gain lawful status to prevent the deportation, right? And if they're not eligible, then I can't do that. So, But I could certainly defend them in deportation court because there are also other petitions that are available that they that are not available outside of deportation court. So sometimes people gain their lawful status in deportation because there's other petitions available as options for them based on how long they've been here, et cetera, and different things. And so I will also tell a person, just because I'm telling you right now that you're not eligible for anything, it doesn't mean that when you do get stopped by ICE, you think you don't have options. There are still options in courts that are not available outside of court. So still contact an attorney and be represented and put up a defense because you can have options in deportation court then too. So, um, and then I also let them know, you know, to consult with an attorney every so often if, um, if unfortunately right now they're not eligible, you know, give it some time, maybe immigration laws will change and you might be eligible for something new or different, right? And so uh, not to think that they don't have any more options. And when I do tell them that they're not eligible, I take my time to explain why not, right? Many times when many times attorneys will just say, no, you're not eligible. And then that's it. You know, bye. And they the don't person, know. Then they, they, it, there, there could be another option. Well, they don't know why not. And then they think that maybe there is that attorney just probably didn't know. So oh, then they're they fishing just around. It to them, be like, OK, you're not eligible. Really, There's no there's no ground or path on which we can take that would be legal. And you're just you don't you really have any legal options. So this is kind of where you're at. Right. And they don't they don't know why. So they. They're thinking, they let, think me, that, let yeah, me ask not, around. Yeah, that attorney's right. not correct. I should talk to other ones, but right. no, they are correct, but here's why. So I explained the why thoroughly, too, because I, unfortunately with immigration law, too, you see a lot of fraud, a lot of notarios taking advantage of people, a lot of... Uh, what even does that a, mean? No, notarios? Not, notary? Notaries. Yeah, yeah, notaries. Oh, sorry, I said it in Spanish, right? Yeah. Well, you did. I mean, I, I, I did translation make sense in the English because notario and notary are yeah. pretty similar, but... So um, they will take advantage of people, and um, then you're in situations where people either got scammed, they got lied to, or even worse, they actually filed a petition for the person, but the person wasn't eligible, and now immigration has all this information about this person and still denied their case because... The notary either didn't know what they were doing and they're not a practicing attorney and filed this case incorrectly, right? So, so it you got to watch out for notaries who are doing what a trained lawyer would do. Right. Mm -hmm. And these people think that, okay, I'm all right. This person seems to know what they're doing about filing the case, but what they don't know is that the consequences could be bad right. because they don't know, like, all they're of just the doing it to make their money or whatever right. they're doing. Mm -hmm. So some won't do anything for them and just take their money. Some will and do it incorrectly. So it's you really need to speak with an immigration attorney who has been doing this, you know, who has the experience and the knowledge about it. And not just any attorney either, because other attorneys practicing in other areas may not have a good understanding about immigration law in particular. So be careful about that too. Make sure that the attorney you're working with does practice, does practice in immigration law. Um, and so uh, I would just, you know, give that caution to. So one of the things I do is, like I said, I explain to people why not. So then that way they don't think 
that there's other things available, they understand why not, and then they don't fall victim to someone who's giving them the answer that they wanted to hear, right? And I will tell them, this is, I try to, before we end the call, I try to make sure that they did understand why not, and then I'll let them know. If you do get another opinion, which you're, uh, I encourage you to get another opinion, you never know, said just make sure to ask these questions. And if the person can address these issues that you have, then don't trust that person. Um, and I try to kind of get that point across. Um, so even if it's a consultation that they're not eligible, we still take the hour because it takes time for them to understand what the, what's holding them back. You must be an angel or saint because it takes a long time. When you say you're doing an hour each one, if you have a lot of clients, multiply that by the number of hours, you're investing a lot of time. I those. know, but the consultations are crucial, and I just, just I to. can never yeah. I can never imagine myself not not doing a consultation for an hour and taking that time to make sure I review things. Um, for for the sake of protecting that person, if in case they're not eligible, and then also for the sake of making sure I'm doing my job properly, because what if things come up later down the road as we're working on the case, and then it turns out, had I asked these questions in the consultation, we probably wouldn't have done X, Y, and Z, or you know, I don't want to have to change a strategy or not be able to take the case because I found out something later down the road that I could have found out during a consultation. So I think the the hour is so important for so many reasons and as much as it's time consuming I don't think I'll change that practice you mentioned earlier about the difference between administrations and what I as a listener listening to what you were saying what what it would seem to me to me is that some administrations for for the president because they have the president has like executive it's Decision making authority, right? They write executive orders, which are similar to making mm -hmm. law, but the executive branch, just as I guess a general rule of government, gets some legislative authority from the legislature. So the Congress gives some of this authority to the president in order, and the president and the agencies that operate under the president, in order to carry out the law, they have some discretion. So each president, from Obama to Trump to Biden, mm -hmm. decides who is going to be a priority mm -hmm. for deportation mm -hmm. based on the level of threat that they would present to national security mm -hmm. or just to the criminal sensibilities and laws of our society. Mm -hmm. So under Obama, it was one set of guidelines. Under Trump, it was very, very Everybody. broad. That it, yeah, it just basically... Everybody who's here unlawfully it, is a target. Because there's like a need based so sometimes it's like well this person committed a crime or, or they're planning on committing crimes or what are conspiring to commit crimes they're a priority but what you were saying is that under trump it was just very broad where Everybody. it was like doesn't matter if you were you're a person who got here you have a job and you're just working hard to take care of your family or to, to grow to to um live the american dream you're a priority for deportation mm -hmm. too just simply because you don't have lawful status so Anybody who wasn't here lawfully, you that are a priority. That just means that you made a leak in an illegal entry into mm -hmm. the country. There's or you could have made a lawful entry and just overstayed. Overstayed. Well, that be kind of becomes illegal, right? I guess mm -hmm. if you right. had you were, you have been allowed to stay here for a month or something, and you've you're now here for several years. So, in an in a, an entry that was made without a passport or without legal justification, whatever reasons may be for a funeral or some kind of family things, and you over, or, or you stayed here, or you, you overstayed the permission, the permitted amount of time that you were allowed to be here. Now you are considered a priority for deportation. Because mm -hmm, you don't have any lawful uh, status to be in the country. So for a lot of people, the challenge is, the way they came here and the administration at the time. So when you say that some people m might be eligible to be here, they might have a spouse who lives here, mm -hmm. they might have a family member who lives here, or when they came here, perhaps they entered legally with their passport but overstayed their welcome. Those are people that you can really help. Mm -hmm. and, and when you mentioned, you also mentioned the uh, prosecutorial discretion yeah for the attorney who is working on behalf of the united states that they have discretion as to how they treat you or how you are sentenced or they, something they have like discretion that. on terminating their case on dismissing the charges um giving more time they they have this pd allows them to have discretion at different levels right 
So. And for for people, just working people, the people you help, discretion means that. <coughs> pardon me. Discretion means that if you're if you're here working and you're just going about your business, you don't you're not on the radar for committing crimes. You're not mm -hmm. a notorious criminal. You're just here trying to make a living, help your family. Mm -hmm. You would not be a priority and the prosecutor then has discretion to say okay we'll give you more time to kind of figure out what avenue you're going to take or um we're dismissing, we'll, your, we're case. dismissing your case and you're you can then adjust the status to legal status or how, oh how yeah like so some people will be in immigration court and they have a spouse who wants the petition for them right you have to do that process with the uscis and then it's so it will allow the prosecutor to say um we're dismissing the case Go, you know, adjust your status with USCIS as opposed to through the court. You know, USCIS can handle this, and that also reduces. Which is easier? Yeah, for well, the it, it is. It is uh, more efficient, right? Because then you don't you address the backlog of the courts of having so many cases when USCIS can handle some of these processes, right? Um, so then, other people that I deal with are are like you were mentioning, helping families, uh, helping families gain lawful status. So as part of my consultation, I, I do a general consultation where I try to determine what are all their options. Sometimes people have already something in mind. They think, oh, I just got married, or oh, my child just turned 21, and that's the one thing that they're thinking they're eligible for. But in my consultations, I will, re I will review all options to be able to see maybe the person has multiple options, and some options have different uh, requirements. So some will require you to leave, some will allow you to be here doing your process, and there's different factors that you might want to consider in comparing these options. So if people have more than one option, I explain the multiple options to see what fits best for their family and them, right? And go that route. If one, if a person only has one option, then I just explain that option, right? So um, for people who have family that have either spouses or the main ones I work with are spouses and um, children who are over the age of 21 petitioning for their parents. Right. Um, I go through their immigration history to determine how can they gain lawful status. Right. So one example that I usually explain to like uh, the spouses when they're petitioning is there's two ways of getting a green card. You can get a green card in the United States through adjustment of status, or you can do consular processing outside of outside of the, the country. Right. So so you can try for that path. The question is whether you're going to do it here or. Will you get your adjustment of status where you're legally here through waiting in another country? And of course. Everybody would probably rather do it here because you don't want to move and come back. Well, and... you wouldn't be moving for a long time. So oh, let me process through just here. to have the interview outside. So um, let me just like briefly explain. Right. So you have those two options, adjustment of status in the United States or consular processing. Can, that can be a mix of both. So if the person is already here and they're doing consular processing, what determines whether you stay or you have your interview abroad is how you entered. If you entered lawfully, were inspected, admitted, paroled, etc., then you're able to do it in the United States, right? And it also depends on who's petitioning for you. Is your spouse a citizen or is your spouse a legal permanent resident? So all these little factors are things that I ask in a consultation to try to determine which option they have, right? So let's just say hypothetically it's a U.S. citizen spouse and they entered here um, lawfully or unlawfully. If they entered lawfully and they overstayed their visa, then we can do an adjustment of status here in the United States because they're with they're uh, married to a U.S. citizen, right? If let's say they are. Um, married to a legal permanent resident then no because the legal permanent resident spouse doesn't have the same um benefits as a u.s citizen so if they came with a tourist visa overstayed because they overstayed they're not eligible we would then wait for the spouse to become a citizen and then try to do the process like that right so depending on how a person enters i can determine is it adjustment of status or outside of the United States, or do they qualify for an exception? Some people are eligible for 245I, which allows them to just pay a $1,000 penalty and do the adjustment here, even if they entered unlawfully, have worked unlawfully, and have several violations. The 245I will forgive those things if you pay a $1,000 penalty. But not every, it's not just paying a penalty. You have to be eligible for 245I, meaning you have had to have a petition filed back in like April of 96 to 2001, have someone have had petition for you then. And through that petition, you can benefit for 245I. 
if your family member is in the military, um, there are also benefits for military, right? Um, and so there's different exceptions to individuals who enter unlawfully. So I also try to screen, are they eligible for exceptions to be able to do the adjustment of status in the United States? And if the answer is no, then we do uh, part of it in the United States and part of it outside. So if hypothetically the person entered unlawfully and um, they are not eligible to do it in the United States, we start the initial petition, which is the I-130, uh, demonstrating the relationship um, and then the other part, if someone entered unlawfully, they need, and they're here, they need a waiver. So then we request a waiver for their unlawful entry and their unlawful presence. But that waiver, um, the I-601A only waives one unlawful entry and um, all the unlawful presence since then. So we do the waiver and that also gets done in the United States. And then the third step is going to their country for the interview. So when they do leave the country, it's for a brief period of time to just get the processing of the interview, get the medical, do the interview, and come right back. So they're not relocating to the other country for a long period of time. Yeah, it's they're 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 gone for a short period of time. But it, to me, it seems like an unfortunate inconvenience to be like, well, I could do this all here, but now you, you literally need me to well, go. Well, you to... can't based on our laws, right? So the law doesn't allow them to do it here. Yeah because of how they they enter so in that sense it's it's inefficient in the sense of just but the rules are the rules mm -hmm. so there's some inefficiency but it's you you did not make a legal entry into the united states of america so you, and lost, you don't qualify for an exception and you don't qualify for an exception we've looked through all the exceptions you do not qualify so you must do your your processing at the cons council outside of our country whichever one that may mm -hmm. be um, and then for those individuals, like one of the things I see that becomes a, a big problem uh, for particularly parents who have children that are 21 and older is that that waiver I was just mentioning, it's only available for certain qualifying relatives. So only your spouse or your parents who is a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident can apply for that waiver for you. And you have to show that they, either your spouse or your parents, will suffer extreme hardship in order to be given that waiver. If you don't have a waiver to waive that unlawful entry and that unlawful presence and you leave the country, you're triggering new bars and you won't be coming back. You know, so everyone who has to leave and do consular processing for their interview abroad, they need to have a waiver. But then parents, if they don't, if both parents are undocumented, then they don't have a spouse who has lawful status. And if neither of their parents um, are, are legal permanent residents or citizens, which for the most part aren't. You mean the husband and the wife, neither of their parents have. It has to be of the person who's being petitioned. So let's say, for example, the child is petitioning for the mom, but the dad has uh, um, citizen parents. But the one who's being petitioned is the mom. No, you can't use your in-laws. You can't you lose can't your parents. Use, so it has to be. Yeah. It has to be your direct parent, right? And so the problem is that the, some of these parents that have the children that just turned 21 don't have that qualifying relative that the waiver requires. So they can do the first part where the child petitions for them and that's going to be approved, but they can't leave the country without a waiver. So essentially those are the parents that I have to give bad news to that unless there's other ways that you can gain lawful status through your child, you can't unless the waiver is, um, unless they make changes to the waiver, which we're hoping that maybe the waiver will add children to it, 21 and over children to it, so that the child can do everything that they can petition for the parent and then also do the waiver for the parent. And then the parent can leave the country because if they leave without a waiver, they they just won't they won't come back. They won't have their case if they enter. We're gonna put out a pin on that right there for just a second. We're gonna. Summarizing um, adjustment of status and consul consular processing. Mm -hmm. So essentially, like I was saying from the beginning, there's two ways that you can get a green card if you're here, right? You may be eligible for adjustment of status or consular processing. How that happens really depends on your immigration history. So it's really important for you to consult with an attorney to discuss your immigration history in particular, all of your violations and your entries and your background to be able to determine which route is available for you, right? 
So um, I can only briefly explain the general requirements, um, but what applies to you will really depend on your background and that consultation. So I highly encourage people to consult with an attorney and make sure that it's not just a five minute consultation because there's a lot of different things that will matter. And so uh, make sure you spend the time to go through your history with whomever you're consulting to determine what options you have if you're here in the United States. The last group of people that um, I also work with in regards to families are individuals who are here, they're citizens, whether they're US citizens or legal permanent residents, but their family members are outside the country and they're not here, right? It's helping them bring their family members into the country lawfully, right? So depending on that family member, um, I will work with them to start the initial petition here in the United States for the demonstrating the relationship. And then from that point on is waiting the period of time that it takes to process and then addressing the interview abroad. And then that person enters the United States lawfully as a permanent resident, right? So those are kind of like the three different ways of uh, helping family members gain lawful status, whether that's adjustment of status, a green card in the United States, consular processing, which is a, if you're here, it would be a mix of both doing petitions in the U.S. and then going out for your interview, having the waiver, going out for your interview, and then the last group, those that are outside the country that are trying to immigrate into the country. Well explained. That was a very good summary at the end. Are your options, depending on your individual facts as a person. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that is just regarding family members petitioning for you, right? Because there's a whole series of ways that individuals can gain lawful status, right? It's not just through family members, um, which me leads to the other group of individuals that I represent, which are victims of crimes, right? So keep in mind for anyone who's listening that if you don't have a relative or any family member, it doesn't mean you don't have options. And so with an attorney, because you may be eligible for other things. So if you um, don't have any family members, or maybe you do, but you're not able to gain lawful status through them because of your violations that make you ineligible, and you've been a victim of a crime, I would highly encourage you to speak with an immigration attorney if you've ever been a victim of any crime. So there's a U visa, and that's a visa that allows individuals who've been victims of crime in the United States to be able to gain lawful status, to gain a U visa for four years. And then ultimately allows you to use that U visa after having it for three years to get a green card. And then after that to get citizenship. So the U visa allows you to do the um, gain lawful status, get a green card and citizenship all on your own simply because you were a victim of a crime. Right now, the U visa does list specific crimes, so not all crimes qualify. I wouldn't try to determine whether your crime qualifies or not. I would just say if you've ever been a victim of any crime, consult with an immigration attorney and then we will review the facts of your case, that specific crime to see, is it one of the qualifying crimes, right? And um, it's also not just like your typical crimes. Uh, it can also be um, things that involve like uh, wage, uh, you know, not getting paid your wages or having issues that you're reporting to the Department of Labor. That's not a crime most of us think about, right? But um, that is also a type of case that you may be eligible for a U visa, depending on the case. So if let's say, for example, you worked for an employer, they weren't paying you your wages or they were um, harassing you or you were having some type of issues and you report that and file a hearing with the Department of Labor and that employer tells you, no, stop or threatens you or tries to um, interfere with the hearing or you being a witness to that, that's considered witness tampering. That's a qualifying crime under the U visa. If, on the other hand, the employer tries to prohibit you from even filing the claim with the Department of Labor, that's obstruction of justice. So you can try to file. Those are two crimes within the U visa that allows, depending on what you're doing, if someone is um, tampering with a witness or obstructing justice, those are other, other qualifying crimes under the U visa. So if anything, at all has ever happened that you have either filed a police report or filed a complaint or an investigation that there is some type of investigating or hearing on behalf of this then consult with an immigration attorney to see if maybe that incident qualifies under the U visa the crimes I deal with most um, most of the time are domestic violence 
sexual abuse, assaults, armed robberies, um, but that's not, you know, all inclusive. There's a series. So I usually tell people, if you've ever had to report anything, um, and it doesn't have to always be with the police, anything that you've ever filed being a victim of something, go and talk to an immigration attorney so that we can determine if you qualify for the U visa. Now, recently, there was a, a recent uh, case in the Ninth Circuit. It's called uh, Medina Tovar. That case uh, just um, issued another possibility for people who are eligible for the U visa to allow their spouses to be included. So spouses, if you file for a U visa petition, you can include your family. You can include your spouse. You can include your children, depending on the ages. Um, and so sometimes I've used this U visa to help an entire family gain lawful status, right? Because one of them was a victim of a crime. Um, the principal, the principal victim, can petition certain relatives depending on who that victim is and their relationship. And so initially, individuals who wanted to petition for their spouses, they had to be married at the time when they were filing the petition to spe uh, petition for their spouse. If hypothetically the person at that time was single or not married to the their partner, and then later on they got married, they would have to wait until they were getting their green card to then petition for their spouse when they were doing their green card process. But now this recent Ninth Circuit case is allowing them to petition for whatever new spouse they have while their case is still pending. So they don't have to wait to get the U visa to then get the green card to then be able to add the new spouse. They can add the new spouse while their case is pending, which is great because many times individuals do get married during this time while their case is pending and they have to wait such a long time to then petition for their spouse. So um, I did wanna highlight that new um, case that happened to let people know if you have a U visa pending right now or um, and it hasn't been decided, then uh, and you recently got married and you wanna consider adding your spouse, this case might give you an option to add your spouse now. Now this is something new, right? So um, keep in mind that things may change. Um, and so, but reach out to an immigration attorney if you're in that situation, just to see if this case can help you um, add your spouse. So um, in terms of petitioning for U visa, In, under the new law, um, or well, it's, under, a, under, it's a Ninth Circuit case. A Ninth Circuit case, so it's outside of we're in well, seven. It, it was applied nationally. Yeah, so it was applied nationally. It hasn't went up to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. or whatever. So currently, that is the, the standard. Mm -hmm. You can still, I guess, apply. In the meanwhile, your spouse is not. Explain that a little bit more, so, just so I understand. So you have a you filed a U visa, right? right? U visas right now are taking about four to five years process. It's a long time. It's a long time. So it's really behind. There's a big backlog because, unfortunately, there's a lot of victims who are immigrants that um, are eligible. And so they during those four years, if their case is still pending and they just recently got married, they should consult with whomever their attorney was that filed that petition and let them know if maybe this case will allow them to petition for their spouse now. So they would be their spouse and their, whoever their family member is that they're adding, whether that's a spouse or their children, depending on the, the relationship, they are derivatives under their application. So ask if maybe you can add your spouse as a derivative under your application while it's pending so that when the case is decided four or five years, right, that you both gain the U visa status and you don't have to wait to get a green card to then petition for them. You can petition for them while your case is still pending. So if you have your U visa status, now have No, a, your U visa case is pending. It's processing. Yes, and if it's successful, you have been approved um, for, for a U visa. It is made official. Mm -hmm. Visa, just so people know who are listening, just means a temporary permission mm -hmm. to stay in the United States mm -hmm. legally. So the U visa, what you would be getting is protection against deportation, a work permit to work lawfully. You can get your social, your state ID, your license. You cannot travel abroad without permission, right? So with the U visa, it doesn't allow you to travel abroad unless you qualify for advanced parole and you have permission to leave the country. You have the U visa for four years. Now that U visa is not renewable. 
So you have to apply for your green card before that U visa expires. That's another like really important things for people who have a U yeah, visa. Yeah, don't just be like, I'm celebrating, got yeah. my U visa. Wait, no, 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 you need to start working right now on getting your Well, green you can't work right away on it. So you still have to wait at least three years to then apply for the green card. So they so, need to put a reminder mm -hmm. for themselves, like that I'm three years, three years in now, I, need I better to apply, apply for, for my, my green, green card. card. How because, long does a green card take usually? So it, dep it really varies. Um, I usually, what I do is I review the processing times on the USCIS website and it'll give us the most current processing dates because it will vary. Last year it was this, a couple of months later it was this, like it changes every so often. Um, but on average I would say give it a year, right? Like if we're just giving averages, a year to process that um, green card. So I always encourage my so clients. So if they're in year three, by year four, they should have it processed. Well, they have to have it before it expires. So the U visa is only four years. So they have to submit that green card petition before the expiration date on that card. If they don't and they don't request an extension, then they're, they lose their status, right? So now they're here illegally and you got another problem. And, right, so it's really important for people to make sure to track those dates and make sure that a green card is filed before it expires or that an extension is requested if you can't file the green card before that expiration you need to request an extension of your visa to then give you more time to file the green card are the extensions uh requests for visa extensions routinely granted or is it tough to it get depends those? uh it depends on the case so i always tell everyone don't wait to the last minute and try to think that you could just request an extension Get your green card process done within those four years right so for my clients i tell them contact me back in two and a half years that gives us half a year before your third year to work on it to prepare everything so that by the third year we're ready to go and filing the the green card and um, i always give them a, a letter highlighting their dates and this very important piece to not let their uh u visa expire and just for, for me, I'm a person, I'm learning so much just by listening to you. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure I know the definitions of all the vo vocabulary we've been talking about. Visa is just a temporary permission mm -hmm. to be here legally. Mm -hmm. Green card is permanent residency. Mm -hmm. And then the top tier, the cream of the cream is citizenship. Mm -hmm. So temporary status, that doesn't sound so good if you're trying to make a life here or live the American dream. Mm -hmm. A green card is good because you're you're a permanent legal resident at that point mm -hmm. it's almost like citizenship mm -hmm. what are the differences between being a green card holder legal green card holder versus a, a u.s citizen mm -hmm. well you can vote only citizens can only vote. citizens can legal vote only citizens can vote legal this is not some <laughs> cnn versus fox news this is just only citizens can vote legal permanence cannot vote so green card holders cannot vote. vote and they should not try because that would be maybe they, that would be voter fraud that well not just that that would be a false claim to citizenship and that could false be false claim to citizenship do you that hear can that cause Fox deportation. News? <laughs> <laughs> that can cause deportation so it's really important for no one unless you're a citizen to vote right um the other thing too is they don't have to worry about losing their status right if you're a green card and you have a green card you, you can still be placed in deportation proceedings. If you commit a crime or if you commit something that makes you deportable, the, a judge can take away your green card, right? Because, because you were a lawful permanent resident, but ha because you committed a crime, you are no longer lawful. No, you're, that, the crime doesn't automatically take away your green card. Not that, automatically. Uh, no, it doesn't. So you, right. a legal permanent resident, will never stop being, never lose their status unless a judge takes it away from them or they voluntarily relinquish their lawful status, right? So only those two ways is the only ways that you lose your green card status, your permanent status, right? But you committing a crime can trigger ICE to detain you, place you in proceedings to then have the judge take away your green Decide card. Decide to take it away. Right? Um, and not just that, there's also, like I said, if you, if you ever claim to be a US citizen and you have a green card and somehow the government becomes aware of this, they can also initiate to issue charges against you to take away your green card, right? Um, so there's different ways that people can commit violations, whether that's immigration violations or crimes, that can trigger losing their green card status. So I always recommend individuals, if you're eligible for citizenship, apply for citizenship within those 
five years that you have your green card or if you're doing it through marriage you can apply for your citizenship in three years after having your green card through marriage you can do wait three years and then you get your citizenship so whether you're doing it through marriage three years or you know not through marriage the regular way like everyone else five years apply as soon as you can that's if you're eligible right you still need to review and make sure you have all the citizenship requirements to be able to um apply but at least you won't be in any risk anymore you know of having that that status removed you hope a lot of people get their citizenship yes um and that's another thing that i i will um assist people with so sometimes i'll have clients that i've known them since i helped them get one thing now they're coming back to help them with their citizenship um, or new clients that they've worked with other people, but now they want to apply for citizenship. So we do a screening for citizenship, too, to make sure that they have all the requirements to become a citizen. So when you were saying earlier on in the podcast that um, you like to see those approval letters, is that approval of green card, card status, citizenship, or both? Uh, no. So, um, wait, um, say that again, Will? I think you, you said that one of the rewarding things of your job, one of the things that is very fulfilling oh, is I do. getting yes, these yes, yes. approval mm-hmm. letters. Yeah, so those approvals are everything. So immigration, when they approve my cases, they send me notices for all cases, citizenship, green cards, U visas. And so whenever I get those uh, notices in the mail and they're like green and they have, they stand out compared to other ones or it's a, it's a card and it's in a priority envelope, I'm so excited, I'm so happy. I'm like, yes, this case got approved. So yeah. Those so are for all, all of sorts those. of things, mm-hmm. uh, extension of visa, um, green cards, uh, or citizenship. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I would just say, anyone, if you if you have any immigration questions, feel free to give me a call. And if I can't help you with that, I also have other colleagues that handle other types of immigration cases, and I'm always referring people that I can't help because within immigration, I also there's certain things I don't do, or sometimes I'm at capacity and I just can't take certain additional cases. Thank you for being honest. Yeah. And so, um, at least for me, I capacity is really important because if I can't help someone the right way and give them my full attention, then I don't want to take that case and not handle it properly. So I am not going to just take a case just to take it and get a client mm-hmm. in the door. I want to make sure this client is actually taken care of and that I have the time to give them the necessary attention to handle their case properly. And if at that time I'm just really busy, I will refer it to my colleagues, and they do it as well, you know. Um, so I do refer to other immigration attorneys who I trust that they'll do that they'll take care of this person if I'm not able to take care of them. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about you or your practice before we sign off? Um, I guess just sharing my contact information if anyone needs to get a hold of me. Um, so you can contact me in different ways. You can go to my website, which is Daisy Dominguez www.daisydominguez.com. Daisy with two S's. <laughs> Daisy with two S's. Two S's. Dominguez.com. And, um, or you can email me, which is the same, daisy.dominguez at gmail.com. Or you can call me, 773-430-7716. Leave a voicemail. That's really important to leave a voicemail. Otra vez. Mm-hmm. 773-430-7716. Okay. And text messages, you're good with text messages. Yeah, too. they can text as well. Text seem to me to be the least like alarming because you're like oh my god i can respond to this later whereas if it was a call it's like oh my god they called me they actually wanted to hear my voice and speak to me i better <laughs> call back immediately <laughs> judge could you hang on this is a call I say. <laughs> um thank you so much for being here and explaining everything because for me a lot of this was new information i'm just trying to learn mm-hmm. along with everybody else and i hope that people out there can learn something from this they can use for their benefit Mm -hmm. and talk to you i'm proud of you i'm impressed by what you've done in in the amount of time since we left law school nobody teaches us how to do this it's all goddamn hard work Mm -hmm. that we've gotten from our from our family before us to do this too so thank you to all those people who came before us to pave the way and um you're a great person it was so nice to hear everything you had to say to hear your passion for it too you're very knowledgeable about the law and i hope that anybody needs your assistance can, can get it and that you know, if you need assistance helping these people get assistance, yeah. you get that going forward <laughs> too. So thank you so much for sharing all that knowledge. And uh, I, I would be open to having you back again to do of this course. again. But you have gave a very thorough layout <laughs> of everything people would need to know. Bless you so much, Daisy. Thank you, Brian. You're living a great it. life. Law school, I love my job, everything. Law school and being a lawyer is so tough. 
we make so many sacrifices in law school with our health, with our well-being, and then getting in the job and trying to navigate this to be who we are today and to be in good shape and to be the best person we can be for our clients. You, you've done all the hard work, and I just I look forward to seeing what the future holds. Thank you. So. I really appreciate you having me here, and it was great to see you again. I know it's been some time, but it's we been still a minute, girl. we still see each, we still know about each other on social media. So I really appreciate appreciate the invitation, and all your kind words, and I'm really excited to just be here and share information with people. Right, the more people know, knowledge is power. So you're one of the reasons why I call this a Blessed Life University podcast. <laughs> I'm blessed to be surrounded with people like you. Stay blessed. Tune in next time. Thanks for listening. We love you. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.